Welcome everybody to this online event at the Centre for the Study of Contemporary Women's Writing in London University's Institute of Modern Languages Research. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm Shirley Jordan, I'm co-director of the Centre and along with Emily Jeremiah, I'm co-organiser of today's conference. This is a truly international event with contributors speaking to us from Colombia, Canada, North America, Japan and Finland, as well as the UK. And a special thanks to those speakers who are navigating time zones in order to take part. I want to thank also all of our paper proposers. It was a really exciting experience, I think, looking through all the abstracts. And I know that some of the proposers are, are, are coming along today, so I really hope you find this forum uh, a good way of feeding in your ideas. In French, we often say, as part of an invitation to an event, venez nombreux, and, uh, and people really are going to do. I think we're going to have a lot of, uh, of attendees today, which is testimony not only to the attractiveness of our speakers' papers, but I think more broadly to the current level of interest in practices and theories of care, as well as to renewed attentiveness to aging, uh, to aging as a vital area of study in the humanities. Um, indeed, I think there's an increasing urgency about both ageing and care to which today's conference responds. These preoccupations are what's currently driving our research as organisers of this event. Emily's research has for a long time revolved around gender, agency and ethics, and she's now bringing to bear this interest specifically on the subject of ageing and care ethics by exploring how contemporary literary texts in German and English conceptualise ageing and care. I too have uh, been working on ageing and care in women's writing, in French and in English, and also in photography. So we're both greatly looking forward to what promises to be a rich set of discussions. And I'm just going to offer a few thoughts now by way of introduction to those discussions on the shape and I think also the timeliness of today's event. My first thoughts concern the recent burgeoning of care theory, a current of thought propelled into sharper focus and expanded relevance by the imperatives of the pandemic, by increasing alarm at climate change, and by a growing need to underscore the incompatibility of care, which is so fundamental to human survival, with neoliberal principles. To single out just one publication that I think gets to the heart of the matter, the brilliant little book, The Care Manifesto, published in 2020, uh, outlines with great clarity and conviction the matrix of domination and system of devolved responsibility on which neoliberalism is built, the multiple crises of care with which we are contending, and the need for a radical vision that acknowledges our common vulnerability and puts care at the very heart of our lives and politics. So this concern to think radically with care is filtering into many areas of academic inquiry, and today's papers will further pursue that thinking in various ways. The second set of thoughts concerns the more determined attentiveness to aging that we're seeing in the humanities, as well as across disciplines and beyond academia, in, for example, memoirs and a wide range of creative works. Aging draws us into the consideration of a particular subset of care related issues. These begin with caring enough about aging to bring it onto the academic agenda in the first place. Later life has been kept quite firmly on the periphery of vision. For a very long time and cultural gerontology is along with the health humanities a relatively new thinking space but aging is now coming center field if simone de beauvoir's seminal la vieillesse published in 1970 sank for decades into relative oblivion it's now being widely revisited and beauvoir's intimate appeal that i quote we must stop cheating the whole meaning of our lives is in question let us recognize ourselves in this old man or that old woman is resurfacing, implicitly motivating new works across genre that seek to dislodge and problematize what are often limited and reductive representations of older people's lives. We're being asked to look harder and to care more. Care of the old in particular is low in status and too readily occluded. And today's event seeks to explore why and how and to examine some of the powerful responses to relationships of care in recent creative works by women, as well as investigating ways in which care might be redefined and reconceptualized. My final brief set of thoughts concerns women. Care is a distinctly gendered matter. 
The thinking and writing about care that I've been referring to so far has been the business of women very largely, just as performing the embodied labor of care with its emotional and physical challenges remains largely the business of women. Women are embroiled in care in multiple interlocking ways, which it has suited the patriarchy to occlude, not least when their attempts to configure it as work rather than as the expression of a natural propensity to nurture and protect. But stories and testimonies about care and women's involvement in providing it are on the increase. Our event takes as its focus women's representation and narrativization of care in theory, literature and visual culture, engaging with contemporary female authored texts from diverse cultural contexts and encouraging the development of comparative cross-cultural perspectives. Our title, Women's Narratives of Aging and Care, highlights narrative's key role in promoting awareness and its potential to bring about change. As Sarah Falkers claims, I quote, telling and reading stories of age opens up debate and embraces complexity and may challenge our ways of thinking. And I'd just like briefly to flag up that the centre is curating a month of events focusing on care. So there's not only this conference, there are three early career researcher seminars organised by Jasmine Cooper and Katie Fleming, which explore care from different angles. So we've had already care, geopolitics and the social. Care and the non-human is coming up on the 21st of March and care and neoliberalism on the 28th of March. So I invite you to register for these on our website if you're interested and they're also being recorded. So uh, you'll be able to, to pop in and, and have a look at them if you miss the date. So just a couple of quick notes now on the structure of today. Um, you've all seen the program. We have three panels of, uh, of 15 to 20 minute papers, plenty of time for discussion. Um, we have a book launch, and then we have a closing session called Collective Conclusions. And this is really for all of us to share our thoughts once we've heard all the papers. We hope the day will generate thinking that goes beyond individual panels and that you want to bring this thinking to the final, uh, final plenary discussion, which might be more of an opening out, in fact, to future directions or a, a space to talk about dimensions of care that haven't been raised uh, during the panels, but that you're interested in. I think that's all by way of introduction. Just thanks so much again to everybody for coming along. And I think that we can move seamlessly into the first panel. Thank you, Shirley, and thank you for me too, to everyone who's participating today. We've been really looking forward to today, and we had a really great selection of abstracts come in, as Shirley mentioned. So I'm now, it's my pleasure to introduce, well, first of all, myself briefly. So I'm Emily Jeremiah, and I'm a professor at Royal Holloway University of London and a member of the CCWW Steering Committee. So I'm delighted to be chairing the first panel of the day, Narratives and Counter-Narratives of Age. And we're going to hear from three speakers, Avril Tynan, Jordan McCulloch, and Martina Palla, whom I'll introduce very shortly. And as Shirley said, each will speak for between 15 and 20 minutes. We're going to be quite strict about that. And then there will be time for questions. Um, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker now, Avril. So Dr. Avril Tynan is a postdoctoral researcher in comparative literature at the Selma Center for the Study of Storytelling, Experientiality, and Memory at the University of Turku in Finland. Her current research explores the roles of ethics and interpretation in fictional narratives of dementia. She's published widely on the representation of aging, illness and death in French and Anglophone literature. She is co-editor of Story Worlds and Journal of Narrative Studies and co-convener of the Selma Medical Humanities Seminar Series. Her paper today is entitled Counter-Narrating Loss in Women's Dementia Fiction in French, Collaboration, Continuity, Care. Avril. Thank you, Emily. I'll start with some um, ideas about um, the, the dominant narratives in terms of dementia. And the cultural narratives that we have today of dementia are dominated by ideas of loss. In her introduction to the diseased brain and the failing mind, Martina Zimmerman writes that contemporary cultural and bioscientific discourses present loss as a key concept for thinking about and understanding dementia and Alzheimer's disease. She writes that when we think about dementia or Alzheimer's disease, we think about it in terms of loss, the loss of mental capacity, the loss of skills and agency, the loss of memory, identity, and personhood. 
And in this paper, I suggest that the cultural narrative of loss, loss presented by dementia, might better and more constructively be understood as a transformation in communication, identity, and memory that allows us to restore possibilities of care as an eminently intersubjective act. So I draw both on theories of narrative collaboration, as suggested by Lars Christer Haydn in his work on dementia, and also on the ideas of transformation in illness and disease, as suggested by the philosopher Harvey Carell. At base is the idea that the cultural idea of loss in dementia relies heavily on narrative theories that posit the construction of a life story as fundamental to social well-being. If we can reconfigure the ways in which we see narrative identity, we can develop an image of dementia as that which does not implicate loss as such, but an experiential transformation that may be potentially even positive and fulfilling. So what is typically referred to as the narrative turn in the biomedical sciences seeks to complement the concrete diagnostic knowledge of disease provided by clinical medical practice with an experiential and humanistic understanding. As suggested in the name, it relies upon the idea that human beings are fundamentally narrative. Human beings, it is argued, storytelling animals, come to understand the world around them by structuring events and experiences into coherent stories that provide temporal and causal sense. At stake in such narrative approaches is the belief that healthy selfhood depends upon an ability to construct a coherent and accurate life story that situates and meaningfully defines who I am and how I came to be over time. Although heavily criticized by such theorists as Galen Strawson and Angela Woods for imposing, and Rolf Alzen, uh, for imposing structure, coherence, and unity where there are no such things, and forcing patterns on what lacks pattern, the narrativity thesis is prominent in discussions of Alzheimer's disease because it enables the dominant sociocultural meta narratives of dementia as a dehumanizing disease. In other words, when subjects are no longer able to situate themselves in time and space or to plot events and experiences within a coherent and singular life story, this view of life as becoming de-storied that we hear about all the time um, is equated to a loss of self and humanity. Yet life stories are never individual. Our stories and thus our narrative identities and narrative selves are not individual, and this is even if I'm espousing here the ideas of having a narrative identity to some extent. But even then, it's not an individual and purely um, independent phenomenon. It's the product and process of interconnections and exchanges between subjects and objects over time and in different places. And so even if we are to accept the notions of narrative identity, we must open it up to allow space for the entanglements of others within our own stories, and hence to a certain alterity of the self. We could think instead of a narrative web in which one's own sense of identity, one's own memories, one's own experiences come into being through entanglements with others. When an individual loses their capacity, and I'll use a sense of loss here, but they lose, as we see it, their capacity to tell stories of their life, or indeed, even if they never had such an ability, which is Strawson's argument, the web of narratives remains, such that the person continues to exist within the narratives of others, albeit not in the same way as they did before. For example, their labor in this narrative process might be changed uh, with more emphasis given to other people. But what I suggest is that thinking of identity or selfhood as a web through which we come into being with others, we can reframe the challenges presented by Alzheimer's disease or dementia to constructions of identity and self. And as such, we can see how the self persists over time and in different spaces, even and including once a person has lost their cognitive function or even died. And this is something uh, Lars Christer Haydn considers uh, when he argues that storytelling 
is always a collaborative enterprise, becoming more deeply entangled as dementia progresses, so that stories are often co-told or scaffolded with the help of others, particularly in family settings, but also present in good healthcare facilities too. What he calls collaborative storytelling has a remedial quality in compensating for one person's advancing dementia by using prompts or repairing the given narrative or by contributing to the story as a joint activity. The self that results from narrative is not therefore to be found in any individual story, but rather emerges in the relations between narratives or in the act of narrating itself. And as Huverin and, and Watanabe, building on Haydn's argument argue, if we move towards understanding narrative as a verb or an adjective in narrative selves rather than a noun, we can envision a self that communicates and is constituted with the help of narratives and storytelling. And so if this is the case and the self remains despite narrative impairment through a web of interrelations, then we can begin to reformulate experiences of dementias as transformative rather than purely degenerative. The disease transforms our relations with others. It transforms the forms and functions of memory and identity but it does not necessarily force them to be lost. Dementia might then more constructively be reframed as a disease that offers new ways of being in the world that are not necessarily or not simply frustrating, terrifying and negative, but potentially informative and interesting, albeit, and this is ethically important, albeit that they are unknown. And so I draw here on Harvey Corral's notion of illness as a transformative experience uh, that does not only close down the possibilities available to us in our lives, but may also open possibilities for well-being, intimacy, and post-traumatic growth in surprising and often overlooked ways. Corral builds on L.A. Paul's notion of uh, philosophical notion of transformative experience in which certain decisions cannot be rationalized because the potential out outcome is both epistemically and personally transformative. Paul argues that major life decisions are often transformative, and thus one cannot know in advance how a certain choice will affect change. The choice to have children, for example. The choice cannot be based upon pre-existing knowledge or perspectives, because only the outcome of the decision will provide that information. For, in a later piece of work by uh, Carell and Ian James Kidd, a very recent piece of work, uh, Paul's notion is expanded in cases of illness to include non-voluntary transformative experience. That is experiences that are unwilled or unsolicited, but that are nonetheless both epistemically and personally transformative. And Alzheimer's disease or dementia presents here an archetype transformative experience. One cannot know what it is like to have Alzheimer's disease until one has Alzheimer's disease. And so at the heart of the idea of transformative experience in dementia would therefore be the alterity of the experience, its inaccessibility in a Levinasian sense as the experience of the other who is unavailable to the self but it would not prevent the possibility that the other undergoes a transformative experience rather than a loss. And so understanding how illness is a transformative experience may help reframe the cultural discourses surrounding Alzheimer's disease as an experience of loss, suffering and protracted death by offering a way to imagine a fulfilling life which is not socially scripted or the life the patient has wanted, but is nonetheless a rich and satisfying life. And sorry, that quote is from Corel. Um, but although dementia does certainly signal the closure of some possibilities, it might also encourage the opening up of others in unexpected and crucially unknown ways. But in the work I discussed today, dementia shatters previous understandings and conceptions of the self and the world. But in so doing, it also opens up new possibilities for experience, change, and growth. 
in ways that, as I will show, are not necessarily good and maybe quite negative, but do not signal loss. So in the absence of any concrete future, the protagonist adapts to their new life, new life world in embodied and embedded ways that demonstrate their ongoing continuity in the world with others. Nothing is lost. Uh, and the work, um, I only discussed one today, but in this novel um, by Anne Pregans, uh, La Reine Nue, or The Naked Queen, published in 2003, um, this is a fictional family narrative told from multiple perspectives over multiple time frames and in several different genres. The protagonist, uh, Julieta Padovani, the family matriarch, presents what are described as little absences or loss of awareness, and eventually the family assume caregiving responsibilities. A diagnosis is never given in the novel, but a number of what are now conventional narrative strategies uh, for fictional works of Alzheimer's disease are used. For example, Julieta was a former prolific author, producing one book every two years for 50 years. So there is a precedent that she is or always was a highly narrative individual, a professional storyteller. Her dementia is therefore textually represented as the disintegration of the narrative. We see ellipses, an obvious search for the right word, um, gaps, absences, and so on, that perpetuate many, many of the common dementia fiction tropes. The reader is often aware of situations or subjects that escape the narrator's realization, such as when Julieta's first person voice tells the reader about a woman called Loretta who always cries, but we as readers know that this is actually the narrator's daughter. And so, Julieta's obvious confusion is represented as only one part of the story. And her narrative identity is multivocal and is therefore preserved to an extent, although it's changed in a changed way, um, but it's preserved and built throughout the novel. Conveniently enough, Julieta has seven children. Julius, Antoine, Pierre, Frédéric, Esther, Marietta, and Loretta. And so, conveniently, the caring responsibilities are shared into daily routines and the novel receives a further perspective when Marietta discovers her mother's diaries. And so fragments of Julieta's written memoirs are interspersed into the story, giving a temporally dislocated but narratively coherent perspective of Julieta many years earlier. And again, something of a convention in narratives of dementia and Alzheimer's disease, the story poses a number of mysteries that are largely resolved through the crisscrossing of stories, timeframes, and genres and are particularly helped by Julieta's diaries. But once a week, the children meet to share their experiences of their mother. And at these meetings, Julieta comes to exist through their stories. Uh, I wrote it somewhere here. Uh, at the center of every scene they evoked or tried to interpret was Julieta, the emaciated naked queen. So as the narrative continues around the present day Julieta, she comes to be through a dynamic process that is not found in any single story, neither her own nor any single one of the children's stories, but among the entanglements of different narrative threads. The construction of the novel's central protagonist therefore stems from her continuity with those around her, with her children. Rather than rely on, upon a single narrative perspective, Julieta's identity, her memory, and her possibilities for being are co-constructed intersubjectively with others. And I emphasize with rather than by. Her narrative identity is not an individual or independent phenomenon, but the product and process of these interactions. Her life story is not lost in the advent of her dementia, but the way in which it is constructed and communicated is changed. Julieta comes into being through a multitude of narratives. Her identity is never the product of an individual construct, but comes into being through intersecting stories and voices. And it therefore has a perpetuity or durability that transcends the individual 
voice, the individual perspective. Her identity does not disappear as her own narrative voice falters, but rather is transposed and transformed within the stories of others. And of course, this is a very vulnerable position to be in, but it's also a potentially valuable one in the sense that we see how Julieta continues to be through the stories of others. Our entanglements in other people's stories, memories, identities, and selves, and the porosity of these boundaries means that dementia reconfigures the organization of narrative structures, or non-narrative structures, but we'll stick with narrative for now. Um, but it reinforces these entanglements by demonstrating how another's stories are interwoven with our own. And what is most interesting in this novel in terms of reframing dementia as transformation rather than loss is that Julieta's presence is felt ever more strongly as the disease progresses. The notion of, lo of loss cannot apply because her presence becomes paradoxically ever more pervasive as the novel progresses. And it's this that is not necessarily positive, but is certainly not a loss. So let's not forget that it is Julieta's illness that acts as a catalyst for the novel and a catalyst for bringing the children together every week. Their relationships, the children's relationships, are defined by their interactions with the illness and consequently with one another. And the novel writes that although she should be uniting them, can't see anymore, although she should be uniting them, the common mother separated them, enclosing them in their silence like an uninvited guest who managed to slip in amongst them to take their place to corrupt the relationship that united them. Julieta's illness is not a purely subjective phenomenon, but a profoundly intersubjective one. And it extends beyond the reach of the individual subject, permeating the boundaries of time, space, and subjectivity. And this is then, I propose, a counter-narrative of loss. Because the fiction novel allows us to construct the person with dementia precisely through the experiential transformations of their disease. Julieta's memories, her identity and sense of self are not lost in the novel, but become more insistent as it progresses, intersecting and intruding into the stories, memories and lives of her children. There is no loss here, but a shift in the ways that all life stories are constructed and communicated. For our practices of care, such a reimagining of the effects of dementia draw attention to the needs of caregivers too, who perform additional tasks in relation to the patient, but also help to show us that the person with dementia is not lost. They continue to be, albeit in ways that are often unknown and unavailable to us but in fundamentally embodied and embedded ways within the life stories of others. And I'll end there. Thank you. Lovely, thank you so much for a really stimulating start to the day. It's a fascinating text that you've, you've chosen to analyze there. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and comments um, at the end of the session. Um, so I'm going to move then to introduce uh, our second speaker today, Jordan McCulloch, who's a PhD candidate in French studies at Queen's University, Belfast. He works primarily on contemporary narratives of illness and bereavement, with a particular focus on the caring dynamics facilitated by the text. His PhD project centres on the role of writing in facilitating a continuing bond between a parent and their deceased child, and how this continuing bond generates forms of care for the child the parent and the reader. And his paper is entitled Tu trouves pas quand même absolument fabuleux d'en connaître un peu moins? Dementia and the Second Childhood as Shared Learning in Sophie Fontanelle's Grand Vire. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you so much um, for the introduction, Emily. And just to say, as I'm uh, sharing my slides here, that as, as you heard in the introduction, this is a bit of a, a new departure for me, and it's hopefully going to be something that I'm going to look at. Uh, should postdoc funding come through and then things like this. So it's a bit of a, an exploration, I suppose, um, at the outset, I'll, I'll say that. So at this PowerPoint, we are. I'll start the timer as well to keep myself right. Here we are. So 
Um, the process of advanced aging has often been conceived of metaphorically as a return to childhood. And this metaphor becomes more recurrent still in the case of dementia. Yet as Harry Caton argues, suggesting that people with dementia are returning to childhood seems to go against so much that progressive thinkers and researchers have been arguing for in dementia care, since in his view, it undermines the autonomy, dignity and agency of people with the disease. That said, as he goes on to note, it is apparent that this metaphor, fragilities of age is universal. It appears in literature across cultures and epochs, and it appears regularly in the ways in which carers describe the person they care for. We're thus faced with somewhat of a conundrum. If the metaphor is understood to infantilize the person with dementia, then it clearly goes against many of the values enshrined in contemporary care ethics. And yet the metaphor persists. In Cormac Sheehan's recent book chapter on uh, metaphors about dementia, he suggests on the basis of George Lakoff's work on a contemporary theory of metaphor, that it is assumed that metaphors and interpretation of metaphors are cross-culturally diverse and open to reimagining, uh, reuse, re criticism and retirement. However, as he goes on to explain, while cross-cultural diversity is to be anticipated, there is evidence to suggest that metaphors have universal functionalities. And it appears that the second childhood is perhaps one of such metaphors. The image continues to have resonance across diverse languages and cultures, enabling, in Sheehan's words, a movement from an abstract concept to a concrete image. And in so doing, uh, the metaphor triggers effects and or experience, it bridges logical gaps, it creates parts to a large hole, it maps out nonverbal phenomena and behaviour. Uh, Susan Sontag, for her part in the landmark study that I'm sure you're very familiar with, Illness as Metaphor, argues that illness is not a metaphor and that the most helpful way of regarding illness, the healthiest way of being ill, is one most purified of, most resistant to metaphoric thinking. I would, however, like to suggest that the metaphor of the second childhood might be reappropriated as a lens through which to read the lived experience of dementia, not in a negative sense, as we've just heard from Avril, underpinned by an emphasis on loss, but rather through a, through a foregrounding of what can be gained by both parties in the caring dynamic, when the one caring and the cared for, to use Nell Nodding's terms, each acknowledge the learning potential of a return to childhood and accept to retomber en enfance, and I'll explain why I'm using the French term in a moment. Such shared learning is the premise behind uh, author, essayist and fashion editor Sophie Fontanelle's 2010 novel, Condir. The novel charts the evolving relationship between an aging mother, who as the text progresses, it becomes apparent, is suffering from the early stages of dementia. Although branded as a novel, as Eileen Hope March remarks in her review of the text, Condir has more the feel of a collection of personal essays. Yet it is nonetheless a novel form, as attested by the text cover, that Fontenelle chooses to express and thereby examine this most intimate of personal dynamics. Through an analysis of the mother-daughter relationship and the bi-directional caring this affords, we'll come to see that a metaphorical understanding of dementia as a return to childhood opens up the possibility for both mother and daughter to embark on this process of shared learning and to embrace the wisdom that comes from the mouths of the children. Uh, sorry, the mouths of les enfants qu'on a très jeune. So in that quotation from the cover um, of the text, and we'll again return to that in a little moment too. So developing an understanding of the mother's representation as a metaphorical child, the French expression retombe en enfance offers a helpful way in, as it allows us to better appreciate the mother's progression towards an eventual state of childlike dependence. The word tombe, meaning to fall, gives the idea of a downward progression or descent, arguably reinforcing many of the ideas of loss commonly associated with this metaphor. Indeed, Hofmark suggests that the text vignette, the fact that the text vignette about the elderly mother often begin with a health issue, a fall, a trip to the emergency room, confinement to bed, serves to underscore an incremental or the incremental retreat from life. In contrast, I would suggest that these falls narrated in Fontenelle's text act as markers of the shared learning in which mother and daughter become engaged. With each successive fall, themselves a symptom of the loss of balance and orientation associated with dementia, we see the mother literally and metaphorically retomber en enfance as she becomes increasingly dependent on others and finds herself in the grip of an apparent mental and physical regression. Uh, early in the text, prior to the narrator's return to the events of four years previous, we read of a scene where the narrator's, sorry, we read of a scene where um, the mother is lying in bed, perhaps after a fall or simply resting. The whole family come to visit, however, which may suggest there's some sort of a decline um, present. We're never quite told at this point. Um, in the description of the scene, the narrator makes reference to the explicit infantilization of the mother by the family. He writes, we've just scolded her for not drinking enough water. We're treating her like a baby. Yet even at this early stage of the text, the somewhat negative attitudes of the film, they are contrasted and arguably countered by the path to wisdom seen in the mother's gaze. 
following this reprimand, the mother mutters to her grandsons, uh, my dears, and, and that's it. She's had enough words. From this moment on, she's content simply to gaze at them in the same way she gazes at us all these days. And this gaze becomes a repeated marker of shared learning and action as the text progresses. A few pages later, the mother experiences the second of a series of narrated falls that permeate her journey into second childhood. And I say narrated falls here because there are various falls that are loosely referenced in the text, but a small selection are only narrated in full. So this is the second of those. Upon telephoning her mother and hearing the words, well, I'm just lying on the floor, the narrator hurries to her mother's home to help her up. However, she finds herself unable to pull her mother to her feet, as despite the mother's repeated claims not to be in any pain, it's quite clear that this action of trying to pull her up is extremely painful for her. So as such, knowing that, that she would be unable to simply explain to her mother what she ought to do, given uh, her dementia, the narrator decides that she needs to show her what to do. We read of how the daughter gets down to her mother's level, adopting the same position as her, how she shows her step by step, of how to get to her feet, return, uh, turning onto her side, then to all fours, then hunkered down, then using the bed to push up, and finally regaining the standing position. With this episode so reminiscent of the way we often teach young children to stand and then to walk, we see an opportunity arise for the one caring and the cared for to embrace an equal footing, a point from which each can begin to learn from the other as they acknowledge the need for dependence one on another. The verb se solidariser here in the original French adds further weight to this. Although the mother finds herself physically unable to regain her feet unaided, the compassion shown by her daughter, reinforcing the caring love evidenced earlier in the text, is enough to allow her to accept um, her daughter's care, for she responds, yes to everything. Sophie, you surprise me. This allows the relationship of increased dependent and the partial role reversal, and I emphasize here partial role reversal, between parent and child to become framed in new terms. Indeed, Fontenelle's narrator articulates this. Dependence, I call that trusting me. What I'm asking you to do, I told her incessantly, is to trust me completely. Although at times the mother is somewhat hesitant, as the text progresses, we see this growing confiance between mother and child, which establishes a firm foundation for shared learning. A fall is therefore the catalyst for learning to come. And we will see this repeated. There are many, many other examples I could give of this, but it continues to be the case throughout the narrative. With the mother's astute or lucid gaze, as it's described in the text, emerging from a place of positional and or metaphorical lowness, and in turn offering a path to wisdom. At the core of this sharing of wisdom, however, lies a highly nuanced understanding of what the state of second childhood for the mother actually is. Although the narrator comes to see her as a little child and lists the attributes that create her of this, um, a male friend of the narrator, himself a philosophy professor, is quick to correct her. Presenting an understanding of the second childhood, which chimes notably with Harry Keaton's work on this issue, he states, no, it's not the same. With a child, you see, your aim is to bring them up in dependence. It's more than a goal, it's a mission. And yet, wait, it's even more than a mission, it's the future. With your mother, however, where are you leading her? The independence to come is yours. Right to the very end, you are the child whom your mother is rendering more independent. She is the mother. Prepare to have everything turned upside down, my friend. Was what she, that is your mother, is currently perfecting is your education in life. Although the mother might now be childlike in many ways, the friend is right, to, right is uh, rightly quick to point out that the mother remains the educator right to the very end. And this is a position that the reader will adopt and turn as our own. It is in this sense then that we ought to review the return to childhood by understanding the mother's increased dependence as a process of falling back into childhood. We see her gain and give access to wisdom that's seen previously uh, to have been unknown. However, she retains agency even in this dependence. The second childhood is not to be understood as a slide into senility and marginalization, rather the integration of the mother's care within the daily activities of the family becomes crucial. The narrator makes this explicit when she articulates the legacy of her mother for her nephews, that is the mother's grandchildren. Although at the end of the life, the mother has um, no words to pass on to her grandchildren. As the narrator remarks, perhaps the most important lesson is in this family, we don't just drop an elderly person. And it's on the basis of an integrated approach to care that we see this learning shared. So, apologies. There we are. So, caring for the mother in a state of second childhood then becomes the core act through which the one caring and the cared for might learn together. Within this caring dynamic, um, it is important to note that the two roles are often unstable, with, I would argue, the mother caring equally as much for her daughter as she seeks to ensure her emotional and mental well-being as the daughter cares for the mother by attending to her physical needs. This caring is birthed out of the decisive moment I briefly alluded to earlier, the sharing of love and a decision to act. It's the full quotation on the screen here, but you can see it, it's quite extensive. So I'll just pick out um, really what I see as the key moment, um, which is the shift 
from the conditional tense, where she struggles to come to terms with the idea that her mother may need care, to the uh, simple future, where it's uh, a decision that there is, as she quotes here, there is a future, sorry, there was, there was a future after all. So this switching from the conditional to the future is a decisive moment, for it secures a future practice of care for the mother and opens up the possibility for learning to come. Moreover, this learning, as we'll come to see, is shared on the basis of the love and compassionate care we see evidence first in this passage. The mother, having given her daughter so much throughout her life, particularly in her own childhood, as the mother now finds herself in need of a similar semi-parental care, the narrator musters everything within her to provide it. You write, yes, she made my childhood a true childhood. Now I can certainly give something back. That's not to say the decision to care is easy, however, for the key issue of who gives and receives in this new caring relationship remains a stumbling block for the narrator. We see it here when she states, I could not give to her. That's it. That's what it is. We want to receive from mother. And this recurs almost to the very end of the text when the narrator reflects, I feel alone. I have given what I would like to receive. Everything comes from me. Nothing will ever come for me. However, one moment changes all of this as the narrator comes to realise just what she is receiving in turn from her mother who finds herself in this state of dependence. Early in the text, we read um, of the mother's wonder now that she's forgetting so many things. As a result of her increasing memory loss, the mother finds fresh joy in the little surprises and simple pleasures of everyday life. She often forgets her daughter is coming to visit, so each, each visit is therefore a surprise. Each, experience, each apparently new experience is a moment to be savoured right down to the way in which... Um, the sunlight comes in through the window, dappling her feet. She views that as a miracle. And it's in the midst of just such childish wonder that the mother utters the profound words that I've used to title the paper today. Don't you find it absolutely fabulous just to know a little bit less? Compare this wonder as the sunlight dabbles around the mother's feet with the narrator's own later realisation of just what she has gained through caring for her mother so fully. Um, as the sun sets, um, the narrator finds herself in a parked car bathed in the sun's soft glow and rays. As she closes her eyes, a strange contentment comes upon her and she realises her mother is alive, not only in the physical sense, but in the emotional, psychological and spiritual senses. From this point on, albeit that there are only six pages in the text remaining, we see a fresh perspective and appreciation for the mother um, and what she has taught her daughter over the years that she's been caring for her. We're reminded of the narrator's words with which she referred to the mother early in the text. She is this wise one who's teaching me about life. I can't help but think that it's only immobility that gives wings to human beings, watching others rushing about so much with no understanding of anything. It's only when the narrator too pauses to reflect, seated in this parked, i.e. motionless car, and the sun bathes her in its fading glow, that she is able to fully connect with the learning her mother has shared with her, that she too can be given these wings, these air that lead to understanding. So in the light of this later realisation, we can read earlier episodes of care differently, reading into each act of care an opportunity for personal growth. Take, for example, the scene in which the narrator is helping her mother to get washed. Note here the low position of the narrator as she hunkers down, as she kneels down rather, um, to care for her mother. As the closeness of the relationship deepens, there's a paving of the way to learning. Um, the narrator exhibits the very traits that um, Mohamed, interestingly a male uh, soignant, tells her she'll never be able to achieve. You wouldn't be able to do it, he tells me. You have to know what to do and how to do it. You have to have learnt, you have to have understood. Reflect for a moment. It's not a chore. It's quite clear that there's no sense of drudgery in the narrator's caring for her mother. It's simply this act of loving care that we've seen recurrently so far, as summed up in the rhetorical question, can you do the same for your children? Can you wash us? Once again, it's a compassionate, loving care that in turn engenders the positive response. Why? Because as Harry Keaton reminds us, um, in understanding dementia as a second childhood and caring for the person in that, we're able to overcome the frequent neglect of a need for safety and security that is engendered by the, the right emphasis on choice and freedom in person-centered care. So then drawing the other part of uh, Keaton's quotation there, in this sense, accepting the childlike may help us care for the reasons that I've just discussed. So the acceptance of this childlike dependence on one on the other and the intimacy that ensues in the caring relationship forms the basis of the resoluteness we find outlined at the outset of the text with regard to shared learning. So just a few pages in, we read, my mother can no longer be taken advantage of. In this regard, she retained power. As she, a woman of supreme dignity, now set about testing us on the question of life and death to decide if we were worthy of the deeper knowledge that she had acquired in this area, to see if we, by chance, had anything additional to offer. 
despite the mother's apparent fragility, given her age and this metaphorical return to childhood, it's quite clear that she is strong and resolute. She seeks to leave a legacy for her family that moves beyond any perceived vulnerability. In this sense, her second childhood is indeed very different from the first, as we read earlier, with the, with the uh, reader's friend, c'est elle la mère, she remains mother. As such, it's, this is not a case of simple role reversal. The contemporary reviews that made remarks such as, um, because her mother has become her child, the author grows, fail to acknowledge that the one caring and the cared for it must accept a mutual dependence, in other words, a double childlike status, in order to grow together. So take, for example, the words that follow this wonder and amazement we discussed a moment ago with the sunlight streaming through the window. The mother reasserts her motherly role in directing her daughter. And we see her preach, sermon is the word, so preach to her uh, daughter and attempt to bring about a change in her attitude to life. You can see the full quotation here um, of, of just what the mother shares. But the wisdom coming from the mother directly after she's just admitted an apparent loss of knowledge and understanding, the words that I used to title the, the paper, and the roles we see here adopted by the two parties with the mother not as dependent but dependee and the daughter dependent on that wisdom and accepting of it attest to the instability of the roles and thus counters the narrative of one-sided dependence that is so often considered to be the root of the metaphor of the second childhood. As the narrator acknowledges, the mother's growing dependence on her, physically speaking, much to her surprise, serves to dismantle her defences, allowing her to open herself to this bi-directional process of learning in which they're both engaged and to share observation, as Hofmart states, about life, or observations about life, which will astonish and sustain her daughter. The narrator continues, um, Today, I can say that in this world in which every inch of one's private life is laid bare, I was able to see what is not shown. In this difficult period, I experienced grace. What she sees and learns during this period of her mother's physical dependence becomes grace to her. It offers a new perspective on the world that changes the narrator fundamentally. Speaking of this, she writes, in any case, these days I'm gripped by a tangible, feminine, a more tangible femininity. And I'm aware of it. The fact is that I have in my hands a bam, taking care of someone. I see this connection with childhood in a much more positive light. I thought I hated the game. In fact, I love it. The care the mother gives and receives from her sorry, the care the daughter gives and receives to and from her mother is thus premised on this trait à l'enfance. In opening up to the child who continues to live within each and every adult, there's a securing of this new learning and personal growth. Without that willingness to tap into the forgotten internal child that appears, at least in the context of this narrative, it would be impossible to access such growth. In the words of Leila, the mother's carer, is a child who becomes discouraged and weakens in us, not the adult who faces adversity right until the end. It is the child we have to praise and encourage in the elderly person. And so too in all adults who wish to learn from, teach and share with an aging and or dementia diagnosed person. So with that final thought, um, I'll draw to a conclusion. In Hofmarch's review of Condio, she describes the text as a tender, wise little book. Such a comment, however, raises the question of where wisdom, where the wisdom of this text lies and why it was published in the first place. While another contemporary review published in Elle magazine refers to Condir as a book full of modesty and grace and suggested with this text, Sophie Fontenelle is going to move you deeply, no one seems really to have felt the need to pin down just exactly why the text is so bouleversant and what it is that offers such wisdom for caring relationships today. Nicole Sellez, contemporary review in uh, Tout pour les femmes, La Vie au Féminin, another magazine, however, does offer the, offer the beginning of a response. She writes, when the author speaks of growth, she's talking of herself. This is an idea drawn directly from the text, following what I've discussed as the decisive moment in this caring dynamic where it's enacted with the shift between the conditional and the future tense. Um, Fontenelle writes, on dire c'est bien après la croissance, on dirait. Um, so having said that, you may be wondering why I've spent the last 18 and a half minutes talking about something that we could have grasped from the text, the grand dire, which is the very title of the text. In order to answer this question, we need to look more closely at the two uh, main words, the grand dire and croissance that um, Fontenelle uses here. So the verb grand dire refers to a personal growth, a growing in or deepening of maturity, while a croissance refers to a physical growth. If personal growth comes after physical growth, then I find myself drawn to another recurrent metaphor for aging, a growing down. Uh, and I, I kind of wondered where this might sit within the broader context. So while, of course, there's a loss of stature associated with ageing, and we see that referenced in this text, one cannot help but notice that in Fontenelle's text, and perhaps more broadly, there's a growing down uh, of the ageing person, not solely in a physical sense, so a downward croissance, you might call it that, but likewise a downward grandir, plumbing the depths of wisdom to be shared with others. And the final metaphor which Fontenelle's text concludes affirms this, but the metaphor is that of a tree. 
growing downwards as it sends out its roots, growing upwards and outwards as it matures and showing the benefit of that growing maturity in the shade it offers under its branches and the support it affords to all those who rest against it. And in this, I would suggest we find the true wisdom of this text and the explanation for its publication. So following the mother's instruction to Ekfila or write it, um, Ekfila or write it, the narrator illustrates as Hoff March argues the value of transmitting such human experience. We as the readers learn that opening ourselves to metaphorical understanding of dementia, which as Golden et al. study shows, offers, she in words, a positive uh, conceptual means to elucidate inner states and an economical means of expression that allows for vivid expressions of feelings and sentiments, there is much to be gained. Thus, an answer to Caton's question as to what insights the metaphor for the second childhood might have to offer in terms of caring for those with dementia, Fontenelle's text demonstrates that growing down in a process of care and engaging with the childlike wisdom that comes from les enfants qu'on a très jeune represents a meaningful and productive way forward. Lovely. Thank you so much, Jordan. Another very stimulating paper and another fascinating text to engage with. And again, I anticipate there'll be there'll be lots of questions and comments at the end of the, the papers. So I'll move now to introduce our final speaker for this panel. That's Martina Palla. She completed her BA in modern literature at the University of L'Aquila. She then obtained her master's degree in philology and literary criticism at the University of Siena. During her MA, she spent a year at King's College London as part of the Erasmus Plus program. She's currently pursuing a PhD in Italian studies at Durham University, funded by the AHRC's Northern Bridge Scholarship. Her research project analyzes the conceptualization of gender in Elsa Morante, Anna Banti, and Natalia Ginsberg's novels with the aim of shedding light on the contradiction between their declared rejection of feminism and their engagement with women in their narratives. And her paper is entitled Non Vore Tocarla, Daughters Repulsing Aging Mothers, Laudomia Bonani, Donatella di Pietrantonio, and Maria Grazia Calandrone in comparison. Thank you, Martina. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I'll start directly. Um, feminist scholars have often highlighted how aging women are underportrayed throughout different fields of studies and arts. They are underrepresented, and when actually taken into consideration, they are depicted in stereotypical ways, focusing on their declining bodies, for example. Um, the, oh, sorry, the, um, um, the representation of these women, of aging women, um, has been defined as, um, the, as um, one-sided, as a decline narrative which associated all the rage mainly with the loss of cognitive and physical abilities. And outside of this kind of representation, women aging are rendered invisible or hyper-invisible. Italian literature is not exempted from this tendency, and even when considering women's writings, um, it is difficult to find aging women as protagonists. And when it happens, and I think to Morante, for example, aging bodies produce often uh, disgust or they are linked with witch-like elements. However, more recently, a new tendency can be observed. Mm. Indeed, in the last years, different novels have been published focusing not only on women aging and what it means and involves, but also on the act of taking care of these women. Scholars have uh, demonstrated how historically care of persons with chronic health needs uh, has rested heavily on women um, um, within the context of the family mainly, as women are believed to have a natural aptitude for caregiving. By taking into consideration three novels across 20th and 21st centuries, Il Bambino di Pietra by Laudonia Bonanni, Mia Madre Un Fiume by Donatella di Pietrantoni, and Splendi Come Vita by Maria Grazia Calandrone, I want to offer an overview on the tendency, or what we could call a tendency, of Italian women writers to use actually stereotypes linked to aging women and female caring vocation in order actually to create complex female subjectivities reflecting on their womanhood and uh, their role of daughters. Indeed, I will argue that in all the selected novels, the protagonists leave their duty, and I use this word consciously, of taking care of their older uh, mothers with disgust both because rejecting the idea to see themselves mirrored in their mother's declining bodies and minds, and both and because also resentful of their mother's um, disamore towards their daughters. By doing so, I want to show how traditional and stereotyped narrativization of female uh, aging um, is actually developed by these authors to offer a reflection on the possibility to break patriarchal expectations. I will first focus on the theme of disgust. 
Um, in Laudomia Bonannis, il bambino di pietra, the protagonist must come back uh, to her uh, childhood home to, to take care of her father firstly and then of her mother. Uh, Cassandra, the protagonist, does not hide the fact that what she does is dictated by a certain sense of duty, not by affection. Uh, the way in which she talks about it is very cold and detached. Um, she said, for example, that um, estendono a me la stima per essere rimasta con i vecchi genitori fino all'ultimo. The only marriage she mentions for herself is acknowledging that not all sons or daughters actually would do that. Donatella di Pietro Antonio's Mia Madre un Fiume is all built on the relationship the protagonist has with uh, her old mother, who is losing cognitive abilities. Also in this case, the protagonist does not hesitate to admit that taking care of her mother is something she does for herself to prove that she is able to fulfill societal expectations um, and to be able to prove that she's a good daughter just because of this. Um, sono una figlia sufficiente buona, uh, sufficientemente buona, le viste di controllo servono a me. Calandrone's motivations are slightly different. What seems to push the protagonist of spending come vita to keep taking care of her mother uh, in the last years of, a of her life is actually a form of love or affection, or at least a way to prove to herself mainly that the, mo the mother-daughter bond is still strong. This acquires even more values if one thinks that what, is, what Calandrone is depicting is an adoptive bond. Uh, she says, sono la guardia del corpo di mamma. Mamma, non essere triste, ci sono io. Mom, don't be sad. I'm, I'm here for you. I'm your bodyguard. Despite the differences behind these protagonist stories and motivation, uh, motivations, there is a recurring motive shared by all these uh, novels, uh, which shapes and at the same time sheds light on the conceptualization not only of mother-daughter relationships, but more in general of female subjectivities in regard of aging. Indeed, all the three protagonists admit feeling a certain disgust when uh, thinking about their uh, older mother's bodies and also thinking about the act of touching them uh, while taking um, care of them. For example, Di Pietro Antonio uh, writes, non la tocco mai, I never touches her, or Bonanni uh, writes about uh, repulsione a toccarlo, un po' ribrezzo di toccarla, so disgust, repulsion, um, and thinking of touching her parents. Um, Calandrone uh, writes, uh, la, vorrei, la, la sollevo ma non vorrei toccarla, would not, mm, I don't want to touch her. Um, also, um, it is a, a kind of disgust that involves also the domestic environments in which these uh, parents and these mothers particularly live. Uh, for example, in, um, in Bonanni, we can read that she breathed actually the, their parents' uh, illness. Um, disinfettante, medicine, degenerazione senile, deve essere impregnata la casa, io mi sono abituata a respirarci. Um, Poems are almost contaminated by these uh, ill parents that are described as babies or even as animals um, who do not distinguish spacing and their functions. For example, in Di Pietro Antonio, ho trovato le mutande sporche tra le magliette spirate. The fact that this feeling of disgust is linked with matters and not with aging in general is proven by some passages. Uh, in Bonanni, for example, the protagonist, um, as I was saying, uh, first has to take care of her. Um, father um, and then of her mother. This, uh, if as for her mother, Cassandra admits openly and with a certain sense of pride that she's not able to touch her because of the disgust she feels, when speaking about the disgust her, uh, that she proves um, towards her father, she's ashamed of it. Uh, at the end of these long passages in which she's describing the act of taking care of her rebellious uh, father, uh, she says, vergognosamente ho vomitato, so with, with shame. Um, all parents, as I was saying, are mm, recurrently described as animals and their caring becomes disgusting also mm, for this reason. However, in Bonanni, if the protagonist is ashamed to be disgusted by the, her own father, vergognosamente o vomitato, she does not regret her feeling of disgust towards her mother. Something similar is traceable also in Calandrone. When the protagonist is more mm, able to take care of her grandma, for example, than of her mother, she, um, she says, uh, assisto nonna che ormai allettata in pericolo di vita permanente diventa un'infermiera esperta sul, cor sul campo di quel corpo difficile. So she doesn't have problems in taking care of, her, of the old body of her grandma. Um, but also in Di Pietro Antonio, the protagonist is disgusted by her own mother, but when describing the act of taking care of her mother-in-law, for example, she does not feel disgust. At the end of these passages in which she uh, wa washes um, her mother-in-law, uh, she says, um, non avevo nessuna difficoltà, lei non è mia madre, I didn't have difficulties because she wasn't my mother. 
uh, thus the, the sense of disgust uh, is clearly stronger when the protagonists are taking care for their uh, aging mothers. It is not something that involves aging in general, but precisely their aging mothers. One possible explanation can be traced uh, in another common trait shared by all these narrations, uh, mothers' disamore towards their daughters, a feeling that they do not develop when aging, but that permeated the whole relationship mother-daughter since the protagonists were children. First of all, these mothers uh, proved to be unable to take care of others, um, of someone else in general, not only of their daughters. For example, in Bonanni, the protagonist's mother is completely unable to take care of her, of her ill husband. Uh, Bonanni writes, Quella volta papà in clinica andava a visitarlo come un'estranea. Se non erano pronte le infermiere si rifiutava. She's like a stranger towards her ill husband. She doesn't want to take care of him or to be intimate with him. In Calandrone, the co-protagonist's mother proves to be unable to support um, others' sorrow, any, anybody, everybody else's sorrow, actually, even that of her own mother. Um, Calandrone writes, Madre sacrifica la vista per non assistere al dolore, il dolore di sua madre che ammalandosi l'abbandona. So what um, Calandrone's mother, because uh, the, the protagonist, even if it's a fictional uh, product, of course, is Calandrone herself, um, abandons actually her mother because her mother getting ill abandoned her. So it's uh, a complicated relationship. Um, in this particular novel, the protagonist ends up taking care of her grandma, as I was saying, abandoned by her mother, by the protagonist's mother. However, she struggles in taking care um, of her own mother, perhaps mirroring her mother's incapability as well. Um, in their lifetime, these mothers uh, neglected their, their daughters, uh, whom they did not love enough. They developed a sense of disamore towards them. Disamore is a word that recurs uh, in these novels. Um, in Di Pietro Antonio, this amore is manifested since the protagonist is only a child. Il nostro amore è andato storto da subito, from the very first moment. Um, Calandrone theorizes that this amore uh, emesso da madre, so a disamore produced by, by her mother, caused by her mother's rush, uh, a detachment fought in vain by the protagonist. Uh, riprovo poche volte a memoria la voglia di stringermi al sudore di contadina giovane e sana. Di lei è rimasta l'assenza. What remained of my mother was the absence. Um, in Calandrone, the disamore um, continues when the protagonist um, is an adult and her mother is getting old, causing uh, an absence similar to that proven or felt also by um, uh, Di Pietro Antonio's protagonist. Um, she writes um, in this uh, poem, um, Mamma, dove sei andata? Where, where are you? Absence is what her mother leaves to her daughter. This happens because mothers themselves uh, refuse their daughter's care. It is significant that when refusing uh, their daughter um, in this way, these mothers actually end up uh, seeking for masculine assistance. In Calandrone, for example, her mother prefers Enrico to her daughter. Um, madre chiede protezione a Enrico, un volontario dell'Unione Italiana Cechi, che abita a due passi, una volta a settimana, alternandosi a me, l'accompagna a fare la spesa. And in this passage, which we can read that um, her mother even uh, prefers Enrico to her and wants to stay with Enrico rather than to her daughter's house. In Calandrone, the mother's dementia is expressed mainly through a violent rejection of her daughter, neither even recognized uh, as such as her daughter. The protagonist knows, however, that by doing this, by acting like this and by rejecting her daughter, this mother is actually depending herself on sorrow. Thus, by accepting to be refused and rejected, the protagonist is actually taking care of her mother or at least she's, uh, she's convinced of this, she, she strongly believes this. And, and at the end of this passage, she, she writes, Allora, c'ero riuscita, mamma, sono il tuo scudo, offendermi ti salva dal dolore. Uh, so be, rejecting me saves yourself from sorrow, so by accepting it, I'm, I'm taking care of, of, of you. Um, in Bonanni, the same kind of rejection of daughters ends up in the research for sons' assistance. However, sons are unable to take care of their uh, old mother, and of their parents in general. There's this episode in particular. Uh, ricordo un episodio, lo raccontava Esther, quando nostra madre dovette separarsi per un pro, operarsi per un prolasso e toccò a lei accompagnarla, assisterla. Era appena arrivato Riccardo, quella mattina corse anche lui in ospedale, stavano portandola in sala operatoria sulla barella, Esther le teneva la mano. Al momento di entrare, già mezza anestetizzata ma lucidissima nella parzialità dei suoi affetti, lasciata la mano della figlia rivolgendosi alle infermiere, disse perentoria, date il caffè a mio figlio. So even if her daughter is taking care of her before her surgery, when uh, this mother sees her 
her son purely cares of him, of Ricardo and of um, offering him a coffee. Um, so this is quite um, explanatory of the kind of relationship uh, this mother has with uh, her daughters and her sons. This happens for a patriarchal, a, third, a strong patriarchal construction of society that will be further um, analyzed later. Uh, but for now, let's focus on daughters. Uh, on the one hand, these daughters, looking at their mothers, can see themselves in the mirror. Their old age to be, their potential dementia, their decadent bodies. Uh, scared by this prophecy, they develop a sense of disgust of them, I argue, when attempting to take care of them. Uh, Di Pietro Antonio's protagonist metaphorically writes about a specchio stregato, a mirror, through which he can see her monstrous mother and hold her ancestors, uh, ancestors suffering the same way when aging. Um, ho paura di lei di incontrarla nello specchio stregato che mi tiri dentro con le mani adunque, che mi abbracci forte forte come non ha fatto mai, dietro le sue spalle intravedo la nonna, la bisnonna, vecchie dementi, che mi chiamano con voci di sirena ghiazzanti. So these women, these uh, aging women, uh, calling her as witches, as sirens. This act of mirroring is also another um, recurrent motive uh, in this novel, the, the fear of falling, um, which is more or less metaphorically, of course. All these women, all these aging women, uh, undergo the risk of uh, falling. And this seem, um, seems a fate shared by all women in general. For example, in Calandrone, we can read, uh, Madre a terra non può rialzarsi. Madre, um, the mother has fallen and she can't uh, stand up. Or in Di Pietro Antonio, Immagino che da un momento all'altro precipiti. She uh, often um, is, is scared by the possibility that her mother falls. Um, and is also a, a fear that they have for themselves. On the other hand, um, as just seen, um, they are not able or they are quite unwilling uh, to take care of their mothers because mothers have neglected uh, their children. The interesting thing is that this form of neglection is strictly linked to the attempt to break certain patriarchal stereotypes. Um, um, daughters trying to take a distance from their mothers and from the uh, patriarchy they suffered and they keep representing. But at the same time, um, mothers have um, searched for a detachment from their daughters in the, in the attempt to um, break the patriarchal expectations and to uh, escape from their role of mothers they were first to fit into. Um, um, for example, in this, um, in, in this passage um, of, um, uh, of Calandrone, um, Calandrone Splendi Come Vita, uh, the daughter is um, struggling to take care of her mother, actually imitating uh, and, at, and at the same time trying to um, uh, subvert, in a way, the model uh, her mother uh, transmitted to her as a daughter abandoning her mother again. So they're, they're quite replicating the same uh, process of um, uh, taking a distance from mothers and daughters, but in vain at the end. Um, Calandrone uh, recognizes the attempt to search for emancipation and for freedom. And this is why she forgives her mother is more easily than other protagonists. She, she writes, Madre fa quello che lei stessa definisce un colpo di testa. Rivendica il diritto al tradimento primario, sia il diritto all'emancipazione della madre e alla libertà. She's searching for emancipation and freedom. As I already mentioned, these um, mothers um, uh, often refuse their daughters uh, and their daughters' assistance in search for a masculine one. Nevertheless, often men seem naturally unable to take care for, for, for others, particularly of their old parents and their mothers. This is made explicit polemically by Bonanni when Cassandra, her protagonist, explains why her brothers do not take care of her parents. Uh, she writes, I ragazzi di mamma si presentano raramente con l'impaccio degli uomini che rifuggono dallo spettacolo della vecchiaia e della malattia. They uh, do not want to take care of their parents because they want to take a distance and be detached by illness and by aging. Men feel a certain disgust, but it's a disgust different from that proven fails by women. Uh, it is more similar to a form of awkwardness. Um, for example, um, uh, here, salgono anche le mogli dei fratelli, benché siano le sole operate davvero, donne brave al doppio lavoro. Um, quando lo hanno visto bloccato da una fasciatura di lenzuolo con le braccia imprigionate, si sono rifatti indietro. So their wives actually do take care of, also of their mother-in-law and their father-in-law, but they refuse to get closer to these ill parents. 
In Bonami, this impossibility for men is often justified by the fear of death. On the contrary, women seem not to be scared of it, neither ever thinking of it. Uh, she writes, alla morte per se non aveva mai pensato, la morte era sempre stata la conclusione delle sue fatiche di assistenza. Women do not think about death, or even if thinking about it, they think of it as a form of liberation and freedom from their duties. The most unusual and interesting aspect uh, of these dichotomic differences between women and, and men is the fact that Bonanni juxtaposes this sense of death with a concept of giving birth, actually. Indeed, if women have the possibility and duty to give birth, they also seem to have the social responsibility to carry people towards death. Um, the two antithetical concepts actually overlap and intertwine in this same Women handled properly the idea of death because they used to give birth. Uh, in an unusual syllogism, if uh, I, I can argue, I would argue that if giving birth is like dying, uh, caregiving is similar to the act of giving birth, as also uh, to the act of dying. Um, la donna è il necroforo, sorry, la donna è il necroforo della famiglia, she writes. This juxtaposition is made plausible every time these authors describe elders as infants, as I was mentioning before. For example, in Di Pietrantonio, every passage in which she takes care of her, takes care of her mother, washes her, um, it is readable also as if she's taking care of a child. Um, at the end of this passage, a proprio docile si lascia mettere in piedi per risciacqua secondo la mia mano che la guida vuol farsi. This passage can also be read as if she's washing a baby, uh, mainly, uh, basically. Furthermore, the juxtaposition um, death bird is witnessed also um, by the passages in which these men have difficulties also in taking care of their children, for example. Um, in Bonagni, again, i maschi non c'erano in montagna a fine settimana per le tossi dei bambini uh, e al ritorno non osavano entrare nelle camere impalliditi, paurosi della morte, again, this fear of death. Women, on the other hand, give birth to these children, take care of them when ill, and take care also of their parents while uh, ill or while dying. What women have towards death, according to Bonanni's words, is una fettuosa confidenza. Uh, they're quite close and intimate with the, the concept of death, because the concept of death is so strictly linked with the concept of giving birth and um, birth in general. Uh, however, uh, these women uh, actually ends up being um, depressed, uh, unhappy, tired, disgusted by their own mothers, uh, particularly. Because as it has been proven, caregiving to a chronically ill elderly person is usually a progressive, all-consuming activity which cannot be incorporated into a woman's life without significant impact on her sense of self, time, freedom, career, and relationships with others. Thank you. Thank you so much for a third really great paper bringing together some very intriguing sounding texts. Um, so I'm going to see if there are any um, questions from the audience, I'll hand it over to the audience now. We've got some hands up. So just to say thank you for three really, really brilliant papers that were very provocative on learning how to care. I think that's one of the things that, 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 that brought the papers together. Um, I'm really interested in this question of, um, it, it, this is concerning Avril's paper, and this question of um, the overlap between the literary text and, and what that's trying to teach us about care um, for people with dementia and um, the clinical space and you know this 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 question of pre preparing people to understand how to care in symbiosis as you as you so you know um, uh, 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 sharply pointed out um, for for Alzheimer's patients this, this question of reframing the disease it seemed to me so compelling and necessary the way you were outlining it and I was just wondering if you knew about you know, some, of the, some of the details of current clinical practice and whether that forms part of current clinical practice. Thank you. Um, it's a great question and it's one I always anticipate but don't actually prepare for because <laughs> um, I, I like to stay firmly in books and theory, but um, it does have practical applications and it should have practical applications. And my experience of the, um, the clinical side of it so far is actually, um, for me, the problem comes in, um, not necessarily in the way that professionals um, approach um, people with dementia and Alzheimer's disease, but is in the way that family and friends do. 
And that, I think, is, um, is what's not being tackled so much. There's a lot, this whole field, everybody is always or can be quite um, derogatory towards healthcare professionals. But in fact, they're often very caring and they do maintain, they don't consider dementia as a loss in the way that people who come across it for the first time when it's a family member might do. And it's that that I think we need to try and challenge more um, and that I think is possible to do with this sort of um, approach. Um, yes, which I sort of interacts with your question without answering it. Um, but that's, I think for me, that's where the cultural narrative is not being addressed and needs to be. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thanks, Evelyn. Thank you. We've got another couple of hands up. Shall we have firstly Dawn? Thank you. Um, my, my comment and my question is again for Avril. Um, I've done a little bit of work on um, Delphine de Vigan's Rien ne s'oppose à la nuit and care theory, and particularly the desire of, because this is an auto fiction, the desire of the narrator to care for her mother's story that she has to reconstruct because her mother had mental illness and ultimately committed suicide for those that, that don't know the book. So she's very, very concerned with being authentic to her mother's story and whether or not she even has the right to tell her mother's story. And in the context of what I've done on that, I'd like to thank you for giving me some other things to think about. And I'd like to ask you if you found any of that um, hesitation on the side of the caregivers um, about the way they reconstruct the narrative of the other. Um, thank you. That's a really great, great question. Um, and is something that preoccupies my work quite a lot because, um, because of this overly simplistic approach where uh, we can just, you know, we just think about being other people and we have empathized with them and everything is solved. Um, and it's that is very, very problematic when it's framed like that. Um, and so in this specific example, um, the kind of what I read as the um, kind of reconstruction or reemergence of the main protagonist is actually, I think, more incidental um, and is not something that the children actually think about or realize that they're doing. Um, which has something quite interesting in it because it's so different to a lot of um, dementia fiction that intentionally, and particularly the ones that have this um, detective focus, there is a search to find something or someone or reconstruct a story. And it is in this novel very incidental. They don't realize they're doing it. In fact, they're kind of trying to get away from this overbearing presence of the mother and then accidentally manage to make her more powerful and more forthcoming than she was before. Um, so in this particular example, no, they don't really think about it. But I think it is quite common, particularly in criticism because, or in analysis, because there is people are becoming more aware that this is a very problematic ethical gray area. Thank you for your question. Thank you for that answer. Okay, we have another hand up, so Adol Giza. Thank you very much for very interesting uh, presentations. My question is for um, Martina Pala. Um, which um, her presentation touches on uh, on a theme I have been very interested in for a long time, um, and um, but when I studied when I have studied I've studied a lot to the mother daughter bond in Italian literature, but actually I didn't pay much attention to the the, the aging mother in terms in the terms in which we look at them today. 
Um, and uh, so what, what strikes me about the three books that Martina has talked about is the fact that some of the, 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 the themes of mother-daughter relationship novels uh, are still there. But I, I, would, I, expect that, I would have expected that from Laudoma, Laudomia Bonanni and probably Di Pietro Antonio, but Calandone is a very recent, is, is a younger writer, and I, but I have not read her, and I expected that, um, well, I would have imagined that there may be a difference. Now, in terms of uh, um, <laughs> getting to my question, is actually my question is similar to Shirley's, and I wondered whether there are any sociological studies about how uh, daughters or families interact with uh, aging parents that tell us a bit more, um, it, you know, more K, more give us more of an idea what, um, you know, how uh, women or ma ma male children, female children interact with aging mothers and the body and whether, um, the, 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 your presentation was very, very rich, and uh, I, I didn't have time to read your quotations while uh, you were speaking, unfortunately. And I wondered whether there, you could emphasize a bit more, or for for me or for us, whether there are changes between the three texts um, more, because um, I couldn't quite grasp that. And also in relation to uh, maybe north and south. I find from my personal experience and from you know family experience, it's absolutely clear men do not take part and it is still the daughter that takes care of, of the, the mother and the father. Um, but I see that um, there is the relationship with the mother's body is actually quite all right. There isn't that sense, unless that sense of repulsion is so repressed that women actually do not um, uh, express it and are not aware of it. Um, and also, so North and South and also urban versus uh, um, uh, other realities, because Di Pietro Antonio, the mother is a peasant, and so it's different reality. Maybe Calandrona's uh, 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 context is one of um, uh, an urbanized society, which may be completely different, maybe. Thank you. Sorry, I have talked a bit too much. Thank you so much for for your questions. Uh, quotes are is using quotes is one of my biggest limit because I love quotes and I always insert a lot of quotes and then I don't have time to read them carefully. So so sorry. That's about okay. It. <laughs> but yes, I'm there. There's there are differences in these texts, of course. And uh, Calandrone, for example, is the most different one uh, in, the, in the three. There are more similarities between um, uh, Pietro Antonio and Bonanni rather than with Calandrone because of what you said, because it is a more uh, urban environment, even if uh, Calandrone um, talks about her mother as a, um, um, yes, as a um, countryside woman when she was younger, but she managed to emancipate and she lives in the city now. So she um, she grew up in a, in a more urban environment. So this does the difference. Uh, Bonanni and Di Pietro Antonio are both uh, from Abruzzo, so the, con the social context and the geographical context is quite the same, so that can be another shared um, uh, reason behind the similarities. Um, I don't know much about uh, sociological studies about it, of course I think they, they are. What I read um, talked about um, women in general and not mother and daughters, but it would be interesting actually to see if there are studies more focus on this particular aspect because of course it would be so interesting to see what science actually can say about it um, uh, also outside of fiction because these are fictional um, characters. Um, uh, yes, I would say that um, the the differences behind between um, uh, Calandrone um, in comparison with the other two is also that Calandrone is talking about an adult bonds, the fact that she has been adopted by this mother, that she has been abandoned by her biological mother and then abandoned in a way, in a different way, of course, also by his, uh, her aging, adopting, um, adoptive mother, is something that I sh that we have should keep uh, into consideration. We should mm, keep in mind, of course. I wouldn't, I had, wasn't able to um, further analyze this 
as this aspect because of the time I had, but it, it is something that makes the difference because it brings uh, a series of traumas that are different from the traumas that uh, Di Pietro Antonio and Bonanni, um, Bonanni's protagonist at least, lived and because it, yeah, it brings into attention um, another kind of sorrow, another kind of uh, relationship uh, different from that um, between biological mother and daughters in these narratives, of course. Um, I would say that what I um, uh, what um, strikes me is the returns of certain uh, terms of a, a certain lexicon. Even if Calandrone is uh, more, um, I don't know. Even if Calandrone is more um, forgives her mother more easily than Bonanni and Di Pietro Antonio, also Di Pietro Antonio, but um, Calandrone is more is trying is always trying to um, justify herself, to justify her mother's um, abandonment, her mother's attitude, her mother's detachment. Uh, she uh, uses her mother detachment and uh, sorrow to justify her role of daughter. If this is something that doesn't um, that doesn't happen, even if it, this is something that doesn't happen in uh, the novels, the certain um, terms, words do uh, recur. Uh, they all say, I don't want to touch them, I don't want to touch her, I feel disgust in touching them, even Calandrone. They talk about disamore, what strikes me was these words recurring. So I thought that there was something linking these uh, mm -hmm. different, of course, novels. Um, then, of course, they declinated these similarities in different ways according to their uh, context, their sociological, geographical context, their stories, because Calandrone is quite, um, Calandrone's story is quite autobiographical, even if it's a novel. So, of course, the, the, the results are different, but I think that the what is um, moving and what is pushing these, um, what, yeah, what is building these relationships is, is quite the same. Um, I don't know if uh, today, as for outside of literature, this kind of relationship with, him, with, with mother's bodies has changed. Probably, yes, it's likely that it is. Uh, I would uh, actually, I uh, agree with you in saying that maybe is a more repressed uh, feeling that these orders managed to, um, to shed light on because they are uh, protected by the fiction. The fact that Calandron is telling her story, but in a fictional way, but it is a novel. The, the fact that Calan that Di Pietro Antonio is likely talking about her own experience, but in a novel, protect them from, um, I don't know, maybe being judged or to expose themselves too much. So the, the this um, uh, filter of the of fiction, of novels and of literature does, uh, help them in um, expressing repressed feelings, something that society wouldn't expect from this woman to feel. The fact that these women are uh, taking a distance and are proving disgust towards their mothers and towards their, their bodies, something unacceptable. But literature allows them to do that, to do it, I, I think, mm -hmm. at least I argue. I hope I have answered your question. Yes, yes, it's interesting. And, and if I may just add one little thing, of course, in Italy, the, the practice of uh, having a living in carer is very widespread in all social classes. And that in real in real life could relieve the daughter of, of that uh, commitment to deal with the mother's uh, repulsive body. So it could be that, um, you know, obviously in literature, we write about those situations that are more uh, emotionally um, uh, challenging rather than what is easy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah that, that's true. And a thing I, I didn't say, and then I'll, I'll stop it, is that these daughters actually feel guilty when um, yeah, putting their mothers into hospitals and into structures which would be able to care for them. Mm -hmm. They feel very guilty in doing this. They, they mm, uh, want to take a distance from them. They know that they would be better, that their mothers would be better and that they would benefit from it. But they feel extremely guilty of it and they end up... Um, yeah, living with them rather than accepting the possibility that some uh, specific persons and professional figures would take care of them. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question now from Mary. I think this is a question. This is a question. Thanks, Emily. Um, just uh, and thanks to the three speakers for just wonderful papers and for all the discussion. I think it's it's really um, so rich. I just have a very quick question for, for uh, Jordan. Um, 
it's um, I, I just found that text uh, so interesting. The way, certainly the way you presented it was just, you know, really, really interesting. And one thing that uh, occurred to me was as you were, as you were taking us through your paper, you were, when you were quoting critical commentary on that text, it was, as far as I could see, it was just book reviews. And I see it's a text that, um, if I noted it correctly, I don't know it at all, but um, uh, 2010. And I'm just wondering, has there been sort of more, I don't know, in-depth um, comment, critical commentary on the text? Uh, you know, apart from, say, book reviews just on that particular text, has it been picked up by people who are interested in the kind of questions that we've been discussing here, Jordan? Do you know or could you tell um, us? Yeah, thank you so much for that. I I didn't find anything. And that's, I think, why I reverted to, to what I did to try and find, um, I suppose, some other voices to situate my own position against. But um, it very much it seemed to be quite popular in a lot of um, magazines and the gendered considerations we've been talking about already. I mean, you probably picked that up in the magazines that I referred to, you know. Um, so it seemed to be quite popular in terms of um, everyday publications like that. There was the one review in uh, the French review, which is the Hofmarsch review that I mentioned. It's only two pages in length. It's not particularly extensive at all. Um, and other than that, there's nothing specific on it. Um, I wonder if it's the, the identity of the author. She has quite this intriguing position. She's quite prolific. She's written quite a lot, but um, from her fashion background, so she kind of has that hat. She's an essayist uh, sort of hat on. She's also got this novel suit so, because she's working in so many different genres i wonder if that sort of she almost falls through the cracks in a way um because she's not necessarily consistent in in, in one area where we would see a bigger uh of, of a bigger production of her work um but no i couldn't find anything um else which was a real surprise to me uh, because of, of who she is really a, as an author so i'm sorry that doesn't, i can't shed any light at all to be honest sorry no you've answered it really well thanks very much because i was just no intrigued that as you say she see you know it, it, it's it's something that I, I would have thought that, you know, some of those quotes were really very, I mean, they were very deep. Mm. And I, I sort I would have expected that insofar as there is a literature around yeah. this. And uh, you know that 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 they that that there would have that there would have been more resonance. Mm. So that's, that's very yeah. interesting to hear. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, it's actually just on that last point you made about about the depth. It was actually really interesting to me because I find it a very deep and profound text. But um, the Hofmarsch review that I mentioned in in the the journal French Review actually says that she doesn't find it deep at all, and she's glad of that because you know there's a comparison she makes to Une douce, the Beauvoir text, Hofmarsch. I mean, and she says that you know thankfully the existential questions are not treated in such an in depth way as they are in Une douce, and, and I'm glad of that sort of the perspective she gives on it. But yet. And the counterpart, she says, uh, Hofmarsch says that there's a, a bitter sweetness in this text that she doesn't find in Une which is interesting because I've worked on, on that Beauvoir text as well before. And um, I see more similar, I, I don't really see that comparison, that, that, sorry, distinction that she makes quite as clearly as she seems to. So I wonder, is it the way that the text has been perceived um, has led to some of those conclusions? But yeah, a very interesting point. So thank you. Thank you, George. Um, there's another question for Jordan in the chat um, from Kate Avery. Is might the mother's newfound wisdom in advanced age dementia be understood as assumed on the part of the daughter as a coping strategy that enables her to adapt to the situation of caring for her mother, Jordan? Um, interesting. So, uh, yes, I think that's a fair point. Uh, I think potentially, that I, I definitely think there is, and it draws on some of the um, ideas that Avril was presenting in her paper with regards to a new a new approach to life, a new way of being in the world, which comes through um, the dementia. So I think there is a new wisdom in, in that sense. The mother experiences things differently and, and has grown in new ways. Um, there's a, I'm trying to think, I can't remember exactly now if I can find it, but it's either the, the, the case in chapter or the she in chapter, one of the two of them talk about uh, the illness, dem dementia, as freeing us from the pathology of everyday life is the way they talk about it. So um, it, it brings a greater authenticity as they read it um, in the individual through the experience of dementia. So I think that's how I would read the new dementia. But in terms of the mother, or sorry, the daughter coping with it, I think potentially it's this, it's a new openness to something that potentially was there, maybe to a, le to a lesser extent, it was sort of latent in the mother. But um, in terms of helping her to cope, there isn't to make the comparison with Martina's paper, there isn't any of these ideas of sort of repulsion or, or not wanting to care for the mother. It's very much from a place of 
well, my mother did this for me. And now that I see her to some extent as a child, I want to return that. And I think in the quotation that I mentioned, so um, it's not, I suppose, in terms of helping her to cope with that, she doesn't seem to feel under that same sort of pressure um, or to feel as, yeah, as, yeah, as pressured or as pushed into having to do it. It's, it's, not, it's something that she wishes to do. Um, and it comes from, uh, it comes from an interesting place too, because the, there's a brother here as well um, so one brother and one and sister who is, is the narrator, who we assume is, is Fontanelle, but obviously because it's a, a novel, it's that little bit of uncertainty there. But um, the brother is always seen as the, the hero child, the golden boy sort of thing. And the, and the, the mother, Font or sorry, yes, Fontanelle sees her mother as sort of disregarding her. So it's funny that even though she's grown up that way, that actually in this end stage of life, she sees herself differently. And I think it comes through the growing the growing intimacy that you see as she seeks to care for her mother, that that perspective changes. And it goes back to that moment that I mentioned earlier about um, this, this decision to act. So it comes from a loving place and a decision to act. So um, yeah, I hope that answers the question, but I think it's quite a different, maybe um, quite apart from other texts that we might read in, in this area. Um, Jordan, there's another question, just a quick one on the text. Is it translated into English? Um, I didn't find an English translation, so the translations that, that I gave were my own, but to be fair, that probably is that I didn't really deliberately look for it, so um, I probably could have a search around and, and see. But um, I would be surprised, based on the fact that it hasn't been picked up in the, the critical works, as we've said, if there was an English translation. Because there's another text, for example, that I'm desperately trying to find an English translation of, and it just doesn't exist, um, which is intriguing because it seems to be that there's a a reluctance for um, English speaking public house, publishing houses to, to publish some of these works. So the other one that I'm thinking of and working on is in the case of a parent who's lost, who's lost a child, it's a different, a different dynamic, but um, some of these have been published. Like I know of a couple in this particular one, again, a very prolif prolific author. who's also a scholar um, and very well known in France and yet yeah, in the English speaking world, it just doesn't seem to want to publish his narrative. So it's an interesting point actually about what actually feeds itself through into uh, the English speaking world. Yeah, really interesting. So we've got um, five minutes left. I wonder if the speakers, I mean, there were, there were such a rich set of papers and there were these really interesting sort of synergies and, for example, the potency of narrative, metaphoricity and stereotyping, that, that was the sort of concern of, of all of you. Um, ethics, um, dementia as transformative, the question of memory and identity. There are so many interesting things that the papers had in common, I thought. I wonder if you've got questions for each other, if there was something that struck you about uh, one of the other's papers that you will sort of take away. Maybe um, Avril, is there anything that struck you about your co-presenters' papers? Um, I think that um, uh, when Jordan mentioned um, about um, the childhood metaphor, because metaphors in, um, in dementia more generally, have been discussed quite a lot, but they're always kind of grouped together. And I think picking that one out, um, and I, I'd not heard about it as a, a kind of falling back into childhood, but as a second childhood, I'd heard this discussion before. But I, I think it's very productive to kind of pick apart that metaphor. And I know that's been done with um, these, uh, the kind of living dead metaphors and the natural catastrophe metaphor, but this childhood one, um, especially because it remains within the human realm, um, it hasn't, to my knowledge, really been kind of mm, broken down and examined. And I think this is a very useful thing to do because I'm sure it applies uh, in other illness uh, experiences as well. Um, so I think that's a very useful trajectory to follow now. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Jordan, do you have any questions or comments on your fellow panellists' talks? Um, I've been scribbling furiously because as my admission at the start of this being a relatively new sort of shift in, in my work, so I'm just having a, a bit of a, a read back through. And I think in both Avril and Martinez's papers, the idea of another being constructed through the eyes of someone else was something that I think is is, is really um, intriguing and I suppose to an extent we're always doing that but I think it's, it's worthwhile to be aware of it and to reflect on that process sort of the I think that that comes through in, in a lot of these texts it's a self 
self-reflective process of writing so that the author articulates how they work through their writing to come to the place of um, establishing an identity for themselves and for another, for the person they're writing about, I suppose. So I think just for me, something I suppose I've been thinking about in other contexts too is just um, how does the author come to write? What are they writing for? What's their purpose in it? What does that do for a reader who engages in this process? And so seeing this now in other contexts um, has really helped me to uh, reflect on some of those ideas in different ways. So. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. And finally, Martina, you have a few minutes. Actually, I would have said what Ariel said about, uh, of course, and thank you both for, because your papers were so interesting and so useful also for my work. Uh, but yeah, the childhood metaphor was so interesting and so well analyzed, because it's something that I also trace uh, in my novels, in my novels. But um, yeah, I couldn't uh, go deep further, and it is so something so recurrent. Also, uh, as for relationship mother-daughters, these daughters that become mothers of these um, uh, ill person who becomes again children in a way it's something that strikes me every time so, so that was the most interesting part for me but thank you both it was so interesting to hear your papers lovely i think we finished in, in time for our break which starts in a couple of minutes officially um, and thank you again to our speakers for three really wonderful papers it's been a really engaging discussion and it's been a great first panel of the day so i'm looking forward to, to the rest of the day as, as i hope you are too um, so if you could come back at 11, um, as I say, they're now having a little break, and um, so then we'll have panel two. Oh, Shirley wants to say something, yes. Yeah. And really rapidly, as an antidote to, um, to mother disgust, it'd be, uh, the most brilliant text I can think of is Ellen Sixwell's text, uh, Mother Homer is, is, is Dead. Um, amazing mother-daughter text. I'll, I'll leave that. Thank you, Shirley, and thank you, everyone. See you in a quarter of an hour. Okay, um, let's move on then to our second panel of the day. And this is a panel entitled Care and Caring, about which we've heard a lot, uh, a lot already, but these papers will be perhaps from a slightly different, different position on the question of care and caring. So again, we have three, uh, three papers, three speakers. And uh, we'll do as before. I'll introduce each speaker before uh, their, their paper, and we'll save the questions for the Q&A um, session at the end. So our first speaker is uh, Kate Averis. Delighted to welcome Kate. Uh, Kate teaches European literatures at the Universidad de Antioquia in Colombia. Her research lies in the field of contemporary literatures in French and Spanish, and in particular, women's writing of transnational mobility aging and the current climate crisis. Kate's the author of Exile and Nomadism in French and Hispanic Women's Writing that came out with Legenda in 2014. And she's edited several collections on contemporary women's writing, including Exiles, Travelers and Vagabonds, Rethinking Mobility in Francophone Women's Writing, uh, a special issue of Nottingham French Studies on Nancy Houston, and Transgressions in 21st Century Women's Writing in French, uh, which came out in 2021. Kate's current research projects focus on 21st century women's writing of female aging and transnational women's writing in the Americas. And the title of Kate's paper today is Still the Care of Sex, Women, Aging and Caring in Contemporary Women's Writing. Thank you, Kate. Thanks very much, Shirley. I'll just uh, share my slides. Okay, so the point of departure for my paper today is the observation that if care of the elderly is often undervalued, then care of the care by the old is often both undervalued and overlooked. In many discussions of care taking place in academia, in the media and in the wider public, Old people are frequently figured as the objects of care and rarely as its subjects. In other words, there's a greater focus on elderly people receiving care and less focus on their role as carers. Within this lack of focus on late life caring, there's a discrepancy between the degree of care work that is carried out by women in mid to late life on the one hand, and on the other, there's a disproportionate attention paid to men's late life caring. 
while women and men may both find themselves in caring roles in late life, this falls disproportionately on women, as Sarah Arba and Jay Jin have pointed out in their sociological analysis of the lives of elderly women in 20th century Britain, from whom I borrowed the title of my paper. While men and women are found in equal measure to care for partners experiencing illness and disability in late life, Arbor and Jin find that women are overwhelmingly the carer sex, in that in addition to caring for their partners, they're also more likely to find themselves caring for grandchildren and other family members, as well as neighbors and other members of the community. Despite the greater degree of care work that women undertake in mid to late life, relative to their male peers, cultural representations of late life caring have tended to feature male carers. As seen in, uh, for example, Richard Eyre's Iris and Michael Haneke's Amour, two films that reached wide audiences and received huge critical acclaim. This cultural and critical focus has disproportionately depicted male carers and female receivers of care by singling out individual cases of elderly women being cared for and obscuring the significant role played by older women as, as a social group in the provision of care in our societies. So in this paper, I take a panoramic approach to discuss a range of recent narratives by Noel Chatelet, Claudia Piñero, Silvia Molloy, and Olga Tokarchuk that focus on women in their 60s and 70s caring for others, whether in traditional or non-traditional family arrangements or beyond the family unit entirely. And while these texts suggest that women are still the care of sex at the out outset of the 21st century, collectively, they also depict the wide range and scope of the modes of caring in which women participate. And perhaps one of the most frequent caring roles that women undertake from mid to old age is the care of grandchildren. But despite this, it's a role that's rarely been represented in literary works from the grandmother's perspective. Noël Châtelet is among the few authors who have dedicated an entire text to the experience of becoming a grandmother, focusing on the transformative and reciprocal nature of the experience. In the as yet untranslated Opé de Verme, whose title is an allusion to the French translation of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Châtelet gives a first-hand account of entry into grandmotherhood upon the birth of her first grandchild in a text that is voiced in the second person and that is mostly addressed to her granddaughter, as illustrated in the opening line, Tu me regardes, you look at me. It is, in this sense, a story of becoming, for both grandmother and grandchild that is triggered by the arrival of the infant and that develops in relation to the care the woman provides the child. The identity of grandmother and grandchild are engendered and shaped in relation to each other, initially through the gaze, as indicated here in the text's opening line, and then consolidated through the repetitive acts of feeding, washing, dressing, playing, and increasingly through language, which comes to adopt a decisive role in shaping these new identities. The grandchild's speech act of naming the author, Manon, reinforces the grandchild's role in bringing the grandmotherly identity into being. And in turn, the infant's linguistic development also spurs on the narrator's own linguistic creativity as she settles into her new role as grown-up mother, as grandmother. The dialogue with Alice's Adventures in Wonderland extends from the title's allusion to the mimicking of Lewis Carroll's linguistic inventiveness in order to frame the adventure of becoming a grandmother in wonder, delight, and creativity. Like Alice, Chatelet describes her experience in terms of both subjective and physical transformation that is shaped by the constant shifting of the parameters of time, space, and subjectivity. Caring is thus presented as synonymous with becoming, with developing a relational, plural, and therefore more enriched sense of self that is consistent with the findings of Nell Noddings of the reciprocity between the different parties in a caring relationship, despite the different engagement of the parties involved in that relationship. For Nell Noddings, the scope of caring increases relative to the degree of reciprocity, 
and the grandmother-granddaughter relationship depicted in Ope de Vaime might be considered to portray an ideal of reciprocity, reciprocity in the caring relationship, insofar as it is highly rewarding and beneficial for both parties. So, so we're, I was uh, making the point that this uh, relationship between the grandmother and the granddaughter in Ope de Vaime then might be considered to portray an ideal of reciprocity in the caring relationship, uh, insofar as it's highly rewarding and mutually beneficial for both parties. Uh, and this is not least because of the discontinuous process of grandparenting that is reflected in the text structure, uh, and more precisely in its short sections, most of which are no longer than several pages that log their encounters and record the stages of their respective becomings as grandchild and grandmother. The episodic nature of the grandmothering in Ope de Valme sits in stark contrast with the constant, relentless nature of mothering in Claudia Pinedo's Elena Sabe, published last year in Francis Riddle's English translation, as Elena knows. In this novel that Monica Flores makes a convincing case for reading as an anti-detective novel, the protagonist, Elena, investigates the death in mysterious circumstances of her daughter, Rita, long after the police investigation has been closed and the coroner has ruled death by suicide. Here, the central caring relationship is one of mothering that focuses on a 63-year-old mother of a woman in her 40s, reminding readers that mothering does not come to an end either with a child's entry into adulthood, nor with a mother's entry into the third age and beyond, nor even when the adult child's life ends. And the phrase adult child is itself a contradiction in terms that poses a certain obstacle to thinking about late life mothering. For Elena, the death of her daughter prompts a reflection on her ontological status as a mother, as is clear from the questions posed by the novel's third person narrator, when she says, is she still a mother now that she doesn't have a child? If it had been her who died, Rita would have been an orphan. What name does she have now that she's childless? If, as Sarah Ruddick has argued, motherhood is a foundational site of care, then it offers a privileged point of departure from which to think about women's caring as a lifelong practice. In the case of Elena Knows, one of the ways in which mothering is expressed is in doggedly pursuing the truth of the daughter's death. But Elena's investigation is thwarted at every turn by those around her, by the police, by the local priest, and by neighbors in the local community who dismiss her refusal to accept suicide as a feasible explanation for her daughter's death, a dismissal that is fueled by ageism and indifference. Her investigation is further complicated by the effects of Parkinson's disease, which greatly limits her mobility and her ability to carry out the daily tasks of self-care, of waking, rising, dressing, washing and feeding herself, and much of the narration is dedicated to describing in painstaking detail the enormous effort and forward planning that is required to carry out these apparently mundane tasks. The extent of the impact of this degenerative de disease on her day-to-day -day life is further conveyed through the novel's structure, which is divided into three parts corresponding to the three tablets she takes during the course of the day, which the novel's action in which the novel's action takes place. Pills without which, for example, even though her brain orders the movement, her right foot doesn't move. This disconnect that Elena experiences between her inner and outer self, or rather her body, which she perceives as sabotaged by her illness, is paralleled by the disconnect she feels between her sense of self and the way she's perceived by others both close and distant interaction, interactions with others convey to her and to the reader that she's seen primarily in corporeal terms as a dysfunctional and disruptive body that is perceived as much older than her chronological age of 63, a sociological aging that is also reflected on the photograph of the novel's original cover of a woman who appears much older than the character in the novel is cited to be. It's difficult to make any conclusions about this novel without revealing its ending, but there is a perceptible shift throughout the course of the narration from the emphasis on the mother's dogged care of her daughter in trying to understand the circumstances of her death and of herself in coping and living with advanced Parkinson's disease 
to the lack of care she receives, both from her daughter before her death and more broadly from the gutted public health care system. Although the novel's conclusion does resolve the central intrigue of Rita's death, in keeping with the anti-detective novel's lack of complete resolution, it, really, it leaves unresolved another wider question of what will happen to Elena beyond the time frame of the novel in the absence of any effective state healthcare system, who will care for her as her illness progresses and her ability to care for herself diminishes. The lack of care that is highlighted in Claudia Pinedo's novel contrasts sharply with the round-the-clock care that is provided to ML, to whom Silvia Molloy's text is dedicated. Described by one critic as both a collection of poems in prose and a sort of journal, Desarticulaciones is a slight but hard-hitting text in which a first-person narrator, referred to as both S and Molloy, records in real time the progression of her former partner's dementia in 45 short entries of no more than a paragraph or two that focus on aspects of language and selfhood that are inevitably disrupted by ML's illness. Scheduled for publication in English translation by Jennifer Croft in October this year as dismantling, the desarticulaciones of the original title could also be understood as disarticulations in terms of the awkward, disjointed language that ML increasingly uses, or as disintegrations in terms of the unhinging of self that the narrator observes in ML as her illness progresses. In a style that is both poetic and testimonial, the autofictional narrator records her participation in a network of female carers that care for and accompany ML, as the narrator recounts her regular visits, daily phone calls, and interactions with carers, health workers, and ML's tax accountant, thereby underlining the practical, if not the physical tasks that she undertakes in response to ML's needs. In the broad definition of care that Joan Tronto proposes, caring is first and foremost physical work but it also encompasses a wide range of practices, dispositions and values that respond to another's needs and subjectivity. It is in this sense that the text itself might also be considered an act of care, insofar as it demonstrates an attentiveness to ML's past and present self, seeking to capture her subjectivity in written form before it is obscured by the loss of memory and language. Through the text itself, Molloy thus acts as a custodian of memory as she lays out in the prologue. I have to write these texts while she's alive, while there's no death or disclosure, to try to understand this being, not being of a person who's disintegrating in front of my eyes. I must do it this way to carry on, to maintain a relationship which endures despite the collapse, which survives although words barely remain. There's also an element of self-preservation expressed here in taking on the care work of memory that drives Molloy to put into writing the transformation wrought on ML by dementia and to shore up the relationship against the loss of language and memory. The text's closing section, all but six lines long, further reinforces its status as care work. And that key to this is the act of writing rather than the text itself. And drawing the text to a close is experienced with a guilt that is, that is akin to that of withdrawing any other type of care. I feel that ending this story is leaving her. I feel like I'm abandoning her. But in a certain sense, she's abandoning herself. So I don't feel guilty, almost. The final text that I want to briefly discuss um, today is Olga Tokarczuk's Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead published in English translation by Antonia Lloyd-Jones in 2018. At the heart of this murder mystery, and here we have another example of the anti-detective novel, which is proving to be a privileged genre for telling innovative stories of female aging. That's a topic for another paper. We have a 76-year-old protagonist and narrator, Janina. Oh God, who likes, I'm not sure I understand. Go away. Who likes... Elena and ML also lives with an illness that puts certain limitations on her day-to-day -day life. Although in Yanina's case, 
this illness is less clearly divined and simply referred to as her ailments with a capital A in an example of the ironic tone which characterizes the first person narration and which is highlighted from its opening line when Yanina says, I'm already at an age and additionally in a state where I must always wash my feet thoroughly before bed in the event of having to be removed by an ambulance in the night. Oh. And, here we, and here we see another example of the idiosyncratic capitalization of certain nouns in the text in night. Lest readers be led to the unfounded conclusion that ailments are the exclusive domain of those in the third and fourth age, the author endows everyone in Yanina's social circle, both her, her age and younger, with some form of mental or physical ailment, whether severe food allergies, depression or alopecia. This is only one of the ways in which this novel pushes back against the stereotypes of writing female aging. Mm. Another is the way that it foregrounds innovative models of care that sit outside the traditional ties of family and intimacy and that envisage caring relations both within and beyond infirmity. No mention is made at any point in this novel of any past or present ties that Yanina might have formed within a traditional notion of family. She's, de she's depicted as neither single, partnered, married, widowed, nor divorced nor as a mother, nor childless, nor child-free. She's simply Yanina. While she makes passing reference to past and present sexual relationships, the principal ties she forms are with three fairly disparate individuals, all marginalized in one way or another from the community in which the novel's set and who she comes to see as a kind of non-biological, non-genealogical family as she observes toward the end of the novel. I looked at them all together, maybe for the last time. Suddenly I saw the four of us in a different way, as if we had a lot in common, as if we were a family. While the three members of her non-traditional family unit certainly come to her assistance when she is afflicted by her ailments, or when she is admitted to hospital on one occasion and on another is ar arrested and kept in a prison cell overnight, these are very much reciprocal bonds, as she, in return, helps her neighbor to lay the concrete in his driveway, assists her former student with his English translation of Blake's poetry, and supports a young friend to pursue her education. In this way, the novel depicts Yanina as involved in networks of intergenerational care in which men also participate and that are reciprocal and mutually beneficial for all involved. Nor is this model of care limited to the human world and much of the narration is dedicated to depicting Yanina's ecological worldview, which does not distinguish between humans and other animals, nor between the human and the natural environment, but sees all beings as integral parts of the biosphere and mutually responsible for its care. thus corresponding to a bioethical and eco-feminist model of care that adopts a more global and more forward-focused outlook. So from this brief overview of these four texts, we've seen that while these narratives of women aging and caring published at the outset of the 21st century still depict women as the carer sex, they nevertheless offer visions of care and caring that reach across generations and genders that are reciprocal and mutually beneficial and that critique society's historical dependence on women's care throughout the female life course. They do this in both non-fictional writing that provide accounts of their author's caring roles and practices, and that posit the very act of writing as care work. And they also do it in fictional texts that push, gap, push back against the stereotypes of female aging, and particularly that of old women as receivers of care, to imagine more innovative and inclusive models of care for the 21st century. Thank you very much, and apologies for the technical issues. Kate, thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. And um, thank you for introducing me to some text I, I, I didn't know and that are now firmly on my reading list. It was, it was such an interesting corpus that you, that you dealt with. And I'm sorry about the technical problems too, but it was brilliant. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on now to our, um, our second speaker. And this is, uh, this is Alice Hall. Um, who is lecturer in contemporary and global literature in the Department of English and Related Literature at the University of York in the UK. 
Um, Alice's research interests lie in theories of embodiment, feminism, medical humanities, and disability studies. Sorry, I'll just put my camera on, shall I? Otherwise, it's a bit rude. There we are. Um, sorry about that. She's particularly interested in 20th and 21st century British and American fiction and contemporary women's writing, and her most recent project is entitled Cultures of Care. Uh, Alice is the author of two monographs and the editor of two edited collections. Her work's been supported by the AHRC, the Academy of Medical Sciences, and the Wellcome Trust, and since being chosen as an AHRC and BBC New Generation thinker, she's made several radio programmes for BBC and given public lectures at the Free Thinking Festival. Um, she completed her BA, MPhil and PhD at the University of Cambridge and has taught at the Sorbonne Nouvelle and Paris Diderot University before coming to York. So welcome, Alice. And uh, the title of Alice's paper is Women's Work, Reading, Writing and Archiving as Forms of Care in the Carers UK Archive. Thanks, Alice. <clears throat> thank you, Shirley. And thank you to Shirley and to Emily for, for organising today's event. Um, can you... Is the sound okay? You can hear me okay and everything? I guess so. Let me know if there's any issues with that or the, or the slides. Um, so yeah, I'm really pleased to be here today. Uh, and the title of my paper is Women's Work, Reading, Writing and Archiving as Forms of Care in the Carers UK Archive. So I'm just gonna try and share my screen, yeah? There we go, okay. Uh, so I'd just like to begin by um, talking about a text that Shirley mentioned in her introduction, uh, which is the Care Manifesto, which was published in 2020. So in that manifesto, the Care Collective argue that we are living at a moment of rupture. Our world, they say, is one where carelessness reigns. They highlight how COVID-19 has compelled many of us to adopt new forms of taking care, from mutual aid to self-isolation. Rhetorically, at least, Talk of care is currently everywhere, they say. But despite this, they argue that neoliberalism has neither an effective practice of nor a vocabulary for care. And these deficiencies are not new. The current crisis is not merely the result of exceptional circumstances and as the much repeated cliche goes, an unprecedented moment. It's rooted in a much longer history in which carers and care work have been systematically underfunded devalued and depleted. Absolutely. As, as Nancy Fraser argued, writing before the pandemic, and this is the quote here on the slide, in capitalist societies, the capacities available for social reproduction are accorded no monetized value. They're taken for granted, treated as free and infinitely available gifts, which require no attention or replenishment. And Fraser connects this crisis of care to the ecological crisis. There are similarities, she argues, between the way that nature is treated in capitalist societies as an infinite reservoir from which we can take as much as we want and into which we can dump any amount of waste and the status of care. In fact, Fraser suggests, neither nature nor social reproductive capacities are infinite. Both of them can be stretched to the breaking point. The systems, policies and language for speaking about care that have been in place across Western societies over decades are unsustainable and so to extend Fraser's metaphor the reservoir is now running dry. So these concerns um, underpin the Cultures of Care project um, which ran between 2018 and, and 2021 um, and was funded by Wellcome and the Academy of Medical Sciences and the project gave me and a, me and a postdoc, um, Dr Hannah Tweed, the opportunity to explore for the first time the archives of the charity Carers UK. In this, in this paper, I want to draw on this research and argue firstly that the archive provides an important context for the current crisis of care and a history of grassroots thinking about care that goes back to 1960. But the archive is also remarkable in its diversity and in its innovative approach and in the innovative approach that Carers UK and its predecessor organisations have taken to questions of form. Included within the archive, alongside the official reports and accounts and minutes of meetings, are literary anthologies, letters, poems, video diaries, competitions, political pamphlets, campaigns and parliamentary speeches. So in the rest of the time that I've got here today, um, I want to think about how the Carers UK archive offers a valuable model for thinking through how reading, writing 
and even the act of archiving itself can help to make connections between past and present, but can also constitute forms of care in their own right, bringing together cultural representation and advocacy, encouraging community building and creativity. The act of creating an archive in itself is, is in itself, I want to argue, a form of care. It suggests that the documents within it are of historical and cultural value, worthy of space and attention, that they should be preserved and cared for in a physical sense, but also cared about in cultural and historical terms. The Carers UK archive preserves memories and materials relating to unpaid work done outside of institutional structures, largely carried out, out by women. In fact, when it was founded in 1965, it was first called the National Council for the Single Woman and Her Dep Dependents, and focused on the care of elderly relatives that traditionally fell to unmarried women. The creation of the archive is fundamentally an act of recognition. As Tanya zanish Belcher and Anka Voss argue, women's archives have a greater meaning than the collections they house. Their very existence confers weight on the value of women's history, increase, increases the demand for sources, and offers the opportunity to promote and enhance the study of women's history. So I think this is perhaps a little bit overstated here, but the point is a good one. They view archives as dynamic and replenishing, um, both documenting the past and inspiring future conversations and research. The Carers UK archive, which has materials dating back to 1960, was created at a particular cultural moment at which the mentality of considering one's life and one's work important enough to be preserved for succeeding generations exemplified a certain degree of liberation. Care is UK and its predecessor organisations are driven by the creative energy of collective mo movements and a commitment to grassroots perspectives, many of which are documented in its, in, in its archive. The founder of the Care is UK archive was Sandra Leventon. She was a self-taught citizen archivist she was both a carer and in later life, a recipient of care. She was a working class woman who cared for her elderly mother for 11 years and recorded her personal experiences in a range of creative forms, including life writing, short stories, engagement with local theatre groups and contributions to television programmes on care, many of which are retained in the archive. During the 1980s and 1990s, much of the correspondence and material that formed the first half of the archive was stored in Leventon's spare room. By late 1999, when the first section of the Carers UK archive was donated to the Manchester Record Office, Leventon had retired and Carers UK had grown from its origins as what she called a shoebox full of letters into an established charity that was making a contribution to public policy on care. The method of developing the archive can also be seen as a significant example of participatory research. Melanie Nine describes this as a way of doing research largely for people who have been considered voiceless or powerless in research. It's about trying to enable people to participate more and thereby by have some more power in the research or research relationship. So it's often regarded as blurring the division between researcher and researched. The Carers UK archive sets out to use the record of past experiences to inform future policy making. It documents the history of legal battles and policy changes relating to care, but also positions women as active participants, as carers, curators, adv advocates, narrators, and researchers, valued social actors, rather than passive objects of study. And as Judith, o Judith Oliver, the founder of the carers, uh, uh, founder of the Association of Carers, wrote in her 1986 report, we are, and always will be, an association of carers, not for carers. Whilst we greatly welcome anyone who supports our aims into associate membership, only carers may define the policies and activities. And this emphasis on carers as active participants, shaping their stories and recording their own histories is reflected in the organization's ongoing commitment to writing as a form of care, as advocacy, as an outlet for creative expression and as a form of community building. In 1965, the Reverend our Mary Webster launched the charity with a series of letter writing campaigns, writing to high profile public figures, academics and newspapers, and writing letters of support to carers across the UK. Webster's strategy <clears throat> was to use writing to raise the profile of carers in general, but also to advocate for very specific policy changes, 
including, for example, changes to the housekeeper allowance and pension credits for women. Writing was used to further the, the aims of the charity, but also to support its economic survival. The charity's first book length publication was a good example of this. Feminine Singular was published in 1974 and was funded in a strikingly modern way using a Kickstarter model supported by a letter-based writing campaign. Throughout its history, Carers UK has maintained this commitment to putting writing by carers and about care at the center of its work. The archive offers evidence of the organization's support for informal pen pal initiatives in the 1960s and 1970s, innovative video diaries by young carers in the 1980s, online forums in the 2000s, social media campaigns in the 2010s, and ongoing support for creative writing. And this intersection between the, the personal and the political and the connection between the lived experience of, care, of carers and the molding of a vision for the future is illustrated by a 2005 initiative. The, er the editors of Caring Magazine asked readers to email or write to them with ideas of what it would or should mean to be a carer 15 years in the future in 2020. The chair of Carers UK, Rosie Foster, summed up the responses in the following way. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. um, the year is 2020. Anybody taking on a caring role for the first time feels that right from the start, they'll get right, they will get the right to back up, including a regular break and a decent income. Stories in newspapers and on TV no longer misuse the term carer to describe a professional, as so often happens today. When a person says they are a carer, everyone will know what they mean and understand the value of what they do. And it's sobering to think uh, in 2022 how, how far away we are from this vision. Um, the revolution that carers are calling for, according to Foster, is fundamentally bound up with specific material changes to their daily lives. But the responses also highlight the importance ascribed to caring about the language that's used to describe carers and the cultural representations that shape public perceptions of care, such as the stories in newspapers and on TV. Attending to the details of the vocabulary and knowing what they mean when a person says that they're a carer is, Foster argues, central to understanding the value of the work that they do. Carers UK and its predecessor organisations also champion reading, out, reading as a form of care, as a way of enriching the imaginative lives of people who may not have much money or freedom to travel and meet new people, as a way of making connections with the experiences of, other, of others across different times and places, and as a mean of accessing and appreciating the rich cultural history of writing about care. This is demonstrated in the monthly newsletter, which, was, which, always, which has always included a regular slot for creative writing by carers, and the charity's online forums, which provide a, a space for informal reading groups in which fiction and poetry about care are discussed. The book length, length anthology, Feminine Singular, that I mentioned just earlier on, has an unapologetically provocative opening. This anthology does not speak for the entire female sex. It's limited to the minority of women who remain single. Always a small proportion of the, whole, of the total whole, a single woman has existed in all eras, in all society and in all classes. In a few cases, she is revered or even glamorized. More often she is used or scorned or pitied. To many people, her singleness is more important than her womanhood and far more important than the simple fact that she's a person like all others regardless of sex or marital status. It's from the isolated fact of singleness that the stereotype has been born. If this book does nothing else, it shatters this stereotype. Feminine singular acts in some cases, in some senses rather, as a microcosm of the archive as itself, bringing together a variety of different forms of writing by authors, different classes, periods and locations. The anthology also spans a variety of genres, so it includes, spe includes speeches and campaign manifestos, translations from classical treatises, extracts from popular novels, plays and poems, and histories of women's lives from the medieval to the modern periods. In a political sense, Feminine Singular challenges the idea of the single woman. It advocates for the rights of unmarried women as a distinct and often voiceless group and represents a call to collective action. In a formal sense, the anthology brings together in a campaigning and reform-oriented format, 
many voices and genres. It disrupts the idea of any single point of view on care and offers instead an invitation to join a variety of conversations across different times and places. Through its diverse multivocal form, the anthology also challenges the idea of the single woman in an aesthetic sense. It draws on and establishes a rich cultural history of writing about single women carers by some of the most celebrated writers in the Western tradition, from Shakespeare and T.S. Eliot to Virginia Woolf, and places these extracts alongside first person accounts from largely unknown female writers, many of whom are carers themselves. Many of these works seek to, seek to capture something about the affected dimensions of care. There is, they suggest, no single way of writing about or representing care, and the complexity of these experiences often re requires innovative and creative new formal and linguistic strategies. So curating these works suggests that they are culturally as well as politically valuable, that we should care about them individually as important historical documents, but also collectively value care itself as an important category for, for critical and cultural analysis in the present and the future. By creating the archive, Sandra Leventon laid the foundations for an ongoing commitment to raising the profile of carers and recognizing their work in practical and creative senses that remains central to the mission of Carers UK today. So in the quotation on the slide here, um, they are of course calling for a better investment in social care, but also for recognition and not just soft recognition, but also a legal duty on the part of the NHS to identify carers in order to promote their health and well-being. This notion of recognition is also a key term for Fraser, who gives a historical account of its shifting significance. In the 70s and 80s, she writes, struggles for the recognition of difference seem charged with emancipatory promise. And she links these struggles for the recognition of difference to sexuality, gender, ethnicity, and race. In the 21st century, however, Fraser suggests that issues of recognition and identity have begun to distract from and even displace economic and material campaigns for the equitable redistribution of resources and wealth. Recognition is, Fraser argues, not enough. It must be paired with a commitment to re redistributive justice that challenges the growing economic inequality in our societies. Her argument does not amount to a rejection of the importance of recognition. Instead, she acknowledges that not all forms of recognition politics are equally pernicious. Culture is a legitimate, even necessary terrain of struggle, a site of injustice in its own right and deeply imbricated with economic inequality. Properly conceived, struggles for recognition can aid the redistribution of power and wealth and can promote the interaction and cooperation across gulfs and dif or of difference. Everything, Fraser continues, depends on how recognition is approached. As I've argued in this paper, uh, the approach Carers UK have taken to participation, cultural work and activism constitute powerful, valuable and often innovative forms of recognition that have been central to the organisation's work from its earliest days. Archiving, writing and reading in many different forms can act as a means of recognising and reshaping conceptions of the economic, personal, historical and effective value of care. They can act as forms of advocacy, can enrich imaginative lives and work towards community building. At this present mo moment of rupture, as we emerge from the coronavirus pandemic, understanding this struggle can help us to think about the importance of language and culture as a terrain of struggle in campa campaigns for redistributive justice. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Alice, if my video had been on, you'd have seen me nodding all the way through. Thank you so much for opening that archive, which is the most extraordinary um, uh, collection of, uh, of narrative and artifacts and so on that I, I had no idea this existed. So it's, it's just fantastic to hear about it um, and, the, and the questions it raises um, that have got so many overlaps with, uh, with the other papers we've heard so far and no doubt with the papers to come as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, so our third speaker is uh, Siobhan Makovani. Siobhan is Professor of French and Francophone Women's Writing at King's College London. She's published extensively on uh, French and Francophone Women's Writing and on the origins of the French Women's Press. 
Her current area of research focuses on representations of the female body and on paradigms of aging. She has recently published a monograph, Figurations of the Feminine in the Early French Women's Press, 1758 to 1848, with Liverpool University Press, and a co-edited volume, Women of the City in French Literature and Culture, Reconfiguring the Feminine in the Urban Environment, which came out with the University of Wales Press in 2019. And her most recent publication is a book chapter entitled Fictional Transgressions and the Matter of Bodies. Um, the title of Siobhan's paper today is Collaborative Care, Sharing Stories of Aging in Recent French and Francophone Women's Writing. Thanks, Siobhan. Thank you very much for that introduction, Shirley, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. As today's conference is testament to, there's an increasing academic and critical interest both in literary representations of aging and in the ethics of care and caregiving. This has no doubt been intensified by the COVID-19 fallout. In particular, there's a new literary focus in France on the practices of administering and receiving care in residential care homes, or EHPAD, as they're known in France, and I've given both terms there. So basically, accommodation for the dependent elderly, or OMS in Switzerland, establishments for social and medical care. The once marginalised old people's home is finally being given mainstream cultural representation in French and Francophone literature as the privacy of the home comes under close scrutiny. Simone de Beauvoir's seminal interdisciplinary text on ageing, La Vieillesse, published in 1970, was radical in its frank discussion of care homes, or what are also referred to as hospices or mouroir, so institutions for the dying. Beauvoir also starred in and narrated a short documentary film, Promenade au Pays de la Vieillesse, which can be viewed as a filmic accompaniment to the book. In both works, Beauvoir criticised the degenerate living conditions vulnerable old people were obliged to tolerate. Quasi-abandoned by often inebriated staff who ignored them, inhabiting long dormitories in architecturally unsuitable buildings. I mention Beauvoir because it's important to emphasise that the current surge, and I do think it, it is a surge, I have to say, of recent French and Francophone publications on care homes is not without precedent. For example, Denis Labin's important survey of caring and care homes for the elderly, La Vie Devant Nous, Enquête sur les maisons de retraite. So I won't, I will switch between reading the French or the English, but I won't read both. So but I've tried to always provide a, a translation. Published in 1995, was a relatively early and influential whistleblower account of the lamentable living conditions of the elderly in France. Until recently, little was known about what went on inside such institutions, institutions whose very existence was often rendered invisible or nominally euphemized. La Belle comments on both the hidden location of many care homes, which are made to blend in with the surrounding environment, and their saccharine or bucolic names such as repose, I think I've listed these, yes, or perhaps decidedly more optimistically, le paradis. Following on from La Vieillesse's interdisciplinary reads, and Beauvoir's book includes ethnographic, historical, biological and literary component, components, recent works looking at the living conditions of care homes in France specifically also take a variety of forms. These can be factional accounts based on real life experiences of former or current care workers or care home managers, fictional accounts, and much more rarely, first person accounts by residents of care homes. These texts examine the practice of care from both the point of view of the giver, but also the receiver of care, albeit often filtered through the perception of the care provider for obvious reasons. By the time most of us will be in care or in a care home, the likelihood of us being able to be a first-hand written witness of our own experiences is slim. These physical and intellectual constraints may also account for the polyphonous nature of many recent publications based in care homes. They tend to comprise multiple snapshots of residents' experiences of life in a home. Interestingly, many texts also play a pedagogical role vis-a-vis -vis current and future carers. They often comprise two halves, one half that relates the real life narrative of residents and or carers, the other that imparts recommendations and professional advice on how to improve the usually negative experience of those portrayed in the first part. 
This socio-medical blooding highlights the much needed role the humanities can play in helping us all to age better. While the occasional positive representation of life on the inside does exist, the overwhelming majority of these works criticize the existential incompatibility of an economic model that obliges residents to pay excessive fees for a typically inadequate mechanized service in which all exchanges are quantified. In other words, it would appear that little has changed since Beauvoir's day, whatever the more attractive facade. Underpinning all these accounts, implicitly or explicitly, is an avowal of the fundamental inequity and perfunctoriness of many paid caring relationships between dependent and service provider. And a belief that literature or literary accounts have a key role to play in improving the transmission of care. A further light motif in these texts focusing on care homes is the conspicuous absence of any leisure activities provided for residents, as well as the dearth of attention paid to them as narrators of their own life stories, whether in everyday exchanges or in more extended conversations. We are reminded of Simone de Beauvoir's explanation for the lack of potential readerly interest in a narrator or in fictional representations of senescence in La Vieillesse, an explanation that seems increasingly outmoded and inaccurate. And I will try and read the English, some of it's hidden from my um, screen. It's true that if an old man is dealt with in his subjective aspect, he's not a good hero for a novel. He's finished set with no hope, no development to be, um, I can't read it, I'm sorry, because the, the screens are over it. As, okay, thank you. As far as he's concerned, it's all over and death already dwells within him. So nothing that can happen to him is of any importance. So um, a pretty uh, dismal uh, judgment from Beauvoir. Beauvoir's belief that the heroic is intrinsically related to the possibility of an active and action-packed future, while fundamentally rooted in her existential philosophy, appears to deny the role played by psychic or experiential growth in senescence, or that literature's imaginative richness and chronological experimentation are unbound by any potential extra textual limitations. Anna Gottlieb, the author of Feminist Ethics and Narrative Ethics, in dialogue with the bioethicist Tom Tomlinson's critique of narrative ethics, views such potential unboundedness as paradoxically limiting the informative role literature can play vis-a-vis -vis real life aging. And she says, first, if one reads a novel in order to broaden one's morally imagination, one's moral imagination, one is missing the actual encounter with a living person and is thus epistemically and morally limited by the four corners of the text. Whatever moral truth is made available by the story, it seems limited situationally to the characters within that story and does very little to speak to those who do not also share the world in which a particular moral lesson unfolds. It is surely the very openness of narrative form that promotes a predisposition to take up the narrative subject position on the part of the reader, or at least on the part of some readers. Reading and caring and reading about caring require that we invest ourselves vicariously in the experiences of another. The term care, as has been repeatedly pointed out, encompasses and requires both emotional interconnectedness and practice, or put more bluntly, work. The ethics of care also speaks to feminist theory in its promotion of the individual, as part of a mutually dependent network of contacts, rather than a self-contained autonomous being. The codependence is narratively illustrated in the multivocality of, the many, of many of the female authored texts dealing with care homes and in the vicarious inhabitation of the other in many recent publications. An inhabitation based on relational and experiential knowledge drawn from a practice of care or an activity of care. At the heart of a feminist ethics of care is the belief that it is our relationship with others that give us the confidence and security with which to become independent, not the other way around. Our so-called natural state is not one of independence, rather we become independent through careful nurturing and collaboration. In other words, autonomy is not the antithesis of socialization, but a learned competency inherent in it. 
Feminist theory, critical and social, has long emphasized the fundamental importance in the sense of both primary and foundational of interdependency to our well-being and growth, and maintained that aspects of such interdependency should be visible beyond the private realm and in society's social and political structures and institutions. The many recent texts dealing with carers and residents and care homes are important because they move us away from abstract notions of care to an ethics of care embedded in precise contextual narrative examples. The first work I want to look at is recently published, Le Récit de la Vie, La Récit de Vie de la Personne Agée en Institution, co-authored by a team of five practitioners who are professionally qualified interlocutors or recueilleuses, receivers of narratives shared with them, either orally or in writing, by residents of all people's homes in Switzerland. The polyphony that underpins many texts about APAD or OMS is reflected in the five authors' voices heard in this text, in that all in turn describe their professional experiences as recueilleuses. All five have university qualifications in the skill of gathering and collating the information that makes up each récit de vie, so life story. Having attended the course first set up in 2011 and convened by the work's principal author, Catherine schmitz at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland. The term recueilleur is an apposite description of the many functions embodied by the listener. The verb recueillir in French means to gather, collect, inherit, record. The noun le recueil can mean a book collection and le recueillement means contemplation or meditation. And I just wanted to include this. Um, this is from a newspaper article at the time of the, the, the course's kind of initial um, setting up. And um, so as you can see, qualification for life story collectors are first for Switzerland and you have this uh, rather intimidating microphone with them. You can just about make out the, the blue uniform behind it um, of the, the interviewer. But this is really, uh, and it's a course that has uh, kind of gone from strength to strength as far as um, the number of participants are concerned. It's still very much um, a very popular um, formation or education for um, a variety of different professions. At the beginning of the process, the recueilleur will clarify the resident who has volunteered to take part in the process, what the resident would like done with their life story, and then have a number of sessions where they encourage the resident to focus on an aspect or aspects of their life. The discussion is recorded and is then written up by the recueilleur or the recueilleuse. According to schmutz the resident is the ultimate authority, both in approving the final version of their story and what becomes of it. That version can be viewed as articulated through a third voice, to quote the American anthropologist, Barbara Meyerhoff, and I quote, which is neither the voice of the interviewer nor the voice of the informant, but the voice of their collaboration. In this co-authorship and the predominance given to the existential importance of storytelling, we see the role of the humanities rather than the social sciences. These are not research interviews, but collaborations between the teller and the listener, writer. Some residents want their récit de vie for personal perusal. Others have more, ambitious, have more ambitious plans for them. These stories may then be published in the form of a bulletin or even a book in some cases, um, which allows fellow residents to learn more about their neighbours and the carers who work in these care homes about the people they look after. Their memories are literally and literal, literarily turned into objects in what could be viewed as a form of salvage ethnography. They can also be deposited in the Archive de la Vie Ordinaire. And this is as sort of similar, makes me think of um, what Alice was talking about previously. I think this is a website mainly for residents of Neuchâtel in Switzerland, um, but it, is, it allows so-called ordinary men and women or the families of ordinary men, so-called ordinary men and women, if they think there is a kind of, uh, if they have a desire to deposit their life story, then they can do so um, on this uh, website. And it says the Association for the Conservation of the Archives of Ordinary Life aims to provide an opportunity for ordinary men and women to have a voice thanks to the accounts they have left us 
of their everyday lives, people who have been and who continue to be the apparently insignificant actors in history. And I'm glad that ordinary is placed in inverted commas because I think what is really striking about so many of the récits de vie in um, the text I've mentioned is the extraordinary elements of um, most lives, not, not their ordinariness. And I just wanted, this is just a, a screenshot of a, a page from the archives. And just to even look at the first one, um, I'll translate rapidly, autobiographical uh, tale entitled Our Lives by a farmer from the Val de Rousse, uh, talking about her childhood at the beginning of the 20th century in a large family. Um, the father of which was assassinated. So already you see that um, even behind these kind of apparently ordinary facades, um, there are kind of extraordinary events being related. But this is just a, a, a resource that um, gathers these um, recits um, if, if you, you want to deposit them there. So they can also be, so they can be deposited in the Archive de la Vie Ordinaire, and I think this act of, de of deposition could also be seen as a means of partially countering the loss remarked upon by the author Amadou Hamati Ba, where he, and again, I'll just read the French because uh, that way I can access everything. Quand un vieillard meurt, c'est une bibliothèque qui brûle. The key point Schmutzbrand's work underlines is that such récit must be a means of valorizing rather than negating the present circumstances of the elderly. In other words, the récit de vie should allow the teller to inhabit the present more fully, rather than occluding it in favour of a richer past. Why is it important that old people be given the opportunity, be given this opportunity in care homes? As Mark Kaminsky observes, storytelling has traditionally been, and in radically altered ways remains, a common social practice in old age. No longer the sacred and technological archives of the tribe Tales are still used to offer counsel on being and doing well. It's no wonder old people take refuge in their stories and homes. They've moved to an unfamiliar, impersonal environment, surrounded by strangers, often in various states of physical or mental decay. And such stories anchor them in the familiar, make sense of who they were in the past and who and where they are in the present. In her work, La Vieillesse and the, the accompanying film, Promenade au Pays de la Vieillesse, Beauvoir talks about senescence as a foreign land. Yet it is perhaps the act of moving into an EPAD or UMS that most captures that sense of exile. This process typically involves an increase in isolation, a lack of knowledge and familiarity of local customs, a leaving behind of the homeland, in inverted commas, in order to mix with strangers in a new and typically socially remote location. Le récit de la vie de la personne âgée, la récit de vie de la personne âgée en institution, promotes the importance of allowing care home residents the opportunity to speak in detail about their past and to bring about the recognition and validation of both self and other. In other words, to prioritize the interconnectedness fundamental to caring and reading. Stories are a way of making the current landscape, the current often foreign landscape of the care home, more familiar, of emotionally navigating this uncharted terrain. Constructing a narrative gives significance to the disparate episodes of a life and renders visible the invisible. It's clearly a form of cultural performance with the distortions and occlusions that may accompany such interactions, but it is also a means of resistance and even liberation. According to Vanessa Willy, quoted in the Récit de Vie, entry into an old people's home can also allow the old person to reinvent themselves to some extent further facilitated by the enforced abandonment of so many material, intellectual and emotional markers. And this can be paralleled in the selective process of narrative construction. Cependant, la vie dans une communauté de soi-disant contraintes s'avère également libératrice puisque le changement de contexte d'existence et par là même occasion d'action permet aux nouveaux résidents qui le souhaitent de s'atteler à la redéfinition de soi. And we as listeners and readers may better know how to navigate our own senescence in a mutually beneficial exchange, rather than ignore or silence the tellers. As Schmutzbrand remarks, qui d'autre que la personne âgée peut identifier les besoins indispensables au bien vieillir et les impératifs d'un âge dont ne sont pas exemples les devoirs de la réparation, de mémoire et de transmission. Le récit de vie is a significant tool in instigating a forward-looking perspective for residents who may view the EPAD 
as an itinoir, so a place where life is extinguished. It reminds their interlocutor and us that the present, often dependent or vulnerable individual, has a rich past. That narrative helps us make sense of our own lives and others' lives. But the written transcription of these accounts contributes to the resident's tangible sense of longevity. Their memories become material. Narrating, transcribing and reading such stories are reciprocal acts of empowerment. Indeed, one of the residents interviewed, Maisie Bilnod, knew a formal social worker, also focuses on the challenges of adapting to her present life in an institution, and in turn interviews some of the carers who have come from elsewhere, such as Cameroon and Angola, and who thus, the text argues, have undergone a further form of exile. Both are portrayed as types of refugees existing on the social margins. Virginia Held repeatedly emphasised the significance of relationality in her description of an ethics of care. Unlike care, virtue, she argues, should be seen as an individual predisposition, predisposition and two virtuous, benevolent people can fail to have a caring relationship, which she describes as one that requires mutuality and the cultivation of ways of achieving this in the various contexts of interdependence in human life. The act of telling, recording and consuming these narratives is also an act grounded in the giving and receiving of hospitality. The significance lies in the notion of transmission, of leaving a trace. Listeners need to give their time and attention to tellers, which is also an act of care. These hoikai act as a kind of intergenerational narrative repository in which emotional care and investment are rendered visible in material form. While this move is clearly beneficial, or generally beneficial, it could be argued to residents, certainly presented as such in the text, carers and families, there is something undeniably poignant about having to timetable specific opportunities for old people's stories to be listened to. What would have formed part of extended family conversations in the past has been formalised and institutionalised in the true sense of the term. Cultural transmission in the form of these personal narratives has somehow been commodified in that the recueilleurs or professionals now step into the gap left by children and family members, acting as custodians of stories that would otherwise be lost. And this is clearly to do with societal changes in caring and familial patterns in which the state has predominantly taken over the act of caring for the elderly from family members, coupled with a much greater sense of life stage segmentations and the end of a so-called useful productivity and labour. However, it's important to look at the hegemonies at play here. Is there a dominant party in the co-creation who acts as cultural custodian, preserving the artefacts and rituals of a potentially disappearing way of life? Or is the act of listening to another story, as I have emphasised, perhaps a more egalitarian act of care and what Joan C. Chonto characterises as a fiduciary duty, a responsibility to assist the weaker party and to fulfil the trust with which the fiduciary has been entrusted. These recits remind us that, the care, that caring in the case of interdependency relations is not only repetitious and reproductive, but can be creative and productive. The carer's emotional work is financially recompensed and recognised, and they have the requisite professional qualifications to carry it out. In other words, this caring is not presented as natural, but skills-based and requires specialist knowledge. Equally, the narrative agency given to the tellers of these tales and their counter-positioning against society's meta-narratives of care are presented as empowering. They are the author of and authority on their own lives. Before concluding, I want to briefly mention Valérie Perrin's book, Les Oubliés du Dimanche. The, I couldn't find a better translation than those forgotten on Sundays, which I wasn't happy with, but anyway. This is a fictional account of a carer's relationship with an old woman in a care home. This book provides the material version of a récit de vie, a life story, as well as recounting the process of engaging with, listening to, and narrativizing a life. In this case, a carer, Justine, leaves a written record of a resident's, Hélène's, life. Analogous to Schmidt Brun's, Brun's work, it has a mise en abîme structure in that it is a book about the writing of a book, Justine's Cahier Bleu or Blue Notebook. 
While most of her peers have left her hometown, Justine the carer is passionate about her job in a care home because it allows her to listen to the stories of elderly residents. Justine's empathy for old people may stem from the fact her parents died in a car crash, about which she knew very little, and she's been brought up by her grandparents. She associates old people with storytelling and wants to tell Hélène's story in order to give this initially illiterate and then blind old woman a voice. Literature has always been associated with collaborative caring for Hélène, in that her husband Lucien used to read to her when she was unable to read for herself. And then Justine, in turn, makes a book out of Hélène's stories that she passes on to Hélène's grandson, the appropriately named Roman or Homo, which is French for novel. Yet Les Oubliers du Dimanche provides the perfect illustration of the interdependent nature of caring, in which the interests of both carer and cared for are not in competition, but their relations are based on mutual uh, cooperation and mutual benefit and respect. This book is about the transformative power of collaborative storytelling, albeit that the third voice, to use Meyerhoff's term in Perrin's text, has significantly more poetic license than in the Récit de Vie mentioned previously. <clears throat> Les Oubliers du Dimanche is saturated with literary names, ranging from Charles Baudelaire to Marguerite Duras to Daniel Steele, with multiple references to the caring, homemaking power of storytelling storytelling and to the imbrication between life and literature. Not only is Justine's own life extraordinary in its narrative complexities and revelations, but the format of the text itself begins to interweave Justine's italicized literary accounts of Hélène's life with her actual daily existence, living with her grandparents and working in the care home, blurring the reader's sense of their separate narrative strands. With reference to the elderly people she looks after, Justine remarks, Leur chez eux n'existe plus que dans leur tête, leur bibliothèque personnelle, ces bibliothèques où j'aime passer des heures. <clears throat> and finally, to conclude, in Tout Compte Fait, Simone de Beauvoir remarks that one of literature's key aims is to privilege our common humanity. C'est, à mon avis, une des tâches essentielles de la littérature et ce qui la rend irremplaçable irreplaceable, unique, surmonter cette solitude qui nous est commune à tous et qui, et qui cependant nous rend étrangers les uns aux autres. While literary accounts can avert us to the shortcomings of many current caring institutions, they can also demonstrate the importance of collaborative caring as a means of empowerment and growth for both cared for and carer, or teller and listener. And a feminist ethics is above, and a feminist care ethics is above all about change. As Meyerson remarks, we enrich the total culture <clears throat> and the members of ignored groups when we aid them to, um, in inverted commas, be themselves publicly and powerfully. It's significant that the elderly provide a model here since they represent a human universal, cross-cutting, specific ethnic and regional membership, assisting them in their movement from victors to victims sorry, from victims to victors, that should be, is a fitting way to bring about internally generated social change. These are stories about stories. And as readers of such stories, by imaginatively projecting ourselves into the lives of recounted others, because we are not limited by the flesh and blood of the real person, to come back to Gottlieb's criticism, we are exposed to a variety of different perspectives on aging, which make us consciously reflect both on predominant social paradigms of aging and on our own relationship to caring. It is a recognition of caring and also reading as intrinsically reciprocal, as an interdependent activity that benefits all of us, that can help break down that Beauvoirian sense of solitude. Thank you. Siobhan, thank you so much for a really, really terrific and rich paper. And it's, sorry, there's a bit of interference there. It's, it, it's just so fantastic to hear a paper that's, that's making such a powerful argument for the connection between narrative and the production of narrative and well-being, health. Um, that was absolutely great. Uh, we have uh, some time for questions now. We've got about a quarter of an hour. So uh, let me throw the floor open and um, ask if people have questions that they'd like to ask to our speakers individually or uh, or 
uh, collectively across the panel. Oh yes, okay, Kathleen's asking a question, so Kathleen, you can go before me. Okay, thank you, Shirley. Um, it was another wonderful, a second wonderful panel. Can you hear me? Okay, my question, it's, it's a very specific question, um, and it's for Alice, and I'm just wondering, Alice, to what extent uh, the archive that you spoke about is available to the public? Like, how well known is this archive? Um, thank you for the question. Um, it's not. It's not available. It's. It, I mean, you can go. You can request access at the Manchester Record Office. Um, so in that sense, it is available. But it was, as far as we knew, we were the first people to really go to, back to the archives since it had been created. Really, so um, hadn't been <laughs> hadn't been um, looked at. Uh, yeah. But um, it seems like, given it seemed to us like, given the the centrality of writing pro processes of reading and of writing and of thinking about the kind of um about the sort of memory work which seemed like a connection to the other papers the importance of that memory work um as a form of care it seemed like that was imp an important uh thing for for the sort of ethos of the charity there is uk uh, rather than it just being kind of interesting because it hadn't been looked at before it seemed really really central that process of going back and thinking about about um, the sort of put the archiving as care and the process of of thinking through that that history and how that history has been recorded and documented and created and valued yeah. so um yeah hopefully other people will be <laughs> will will it will discover it a bit more um yes in the future yes that's wonderful and that's of course where your work comes in making it more um uh, make, making more people knowledgeable about the fact that it exists. Um, yeah, I hope so, and I think hope. Um, and just hope also, just that obviously the case I was making that is it's important and valuable in its own right, but also just for the for the broader questions that it raises um, yeah. as, as well. Yeah. Thanks so much. While we're waiting for a, a, another hand, I will, I will just say that um, it's, you know, one thing that's interesting is it's not just the collecting or the making of these materials, but it's then the circulation of them, whether it's, you know, within, within the care home or, or with these archives becoming porous to people. I'm, I'm really amazed to hear that actually, uh, Alice, they, you know, this really proactive collection of, of, of narratives and all sorts of material has gone on but it seems very different from, say, the mass observation archive, which is very, very proactively used by all, all sorts of researchers in the social sciences and elsewhere. It, it seems curious that it's it, it's kind of been, you make it sound like a time capsule or something that, that uh, you know, yeah, just cracking yeah. open. I mean, the anthology that I um, that I mentioned, this, the feminine singular one, which has got kind of really central to the argument I was making about the, the ways in which literature and anthologizing has also been 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 used as a way of making the case for the importance of of the lit of the literary um uh so that is available because that's a published you know that's published by feminist press and that's available as a as a book <laughs> but um so there are there are publications obviously which are available from it but not the whole the whole archive and actually i was, I was going to ask um okay ask you one just that question that really direct question practical question um occurred to me about um, you were talking about the archives of ordinary life, and I wondered who can access them. Is it you talked about families accessing them, but I didn't, are they open access or? They are not open access. No, they are. Well, they are open access in the sense if you become a member of the association, you can access them. Yes. Yeah. So there's no. They're not solely available because there's. I think the sense is that they're seen as a kind of, you know, ethnographic historical community document and made up of, of the kind of the literary devie of multiple individuals. So I did have a look, and because I wanted to have a look at the various, what the French would call font, where you kind of go in and access them. But I scrolled to the bottom of the page and it says, if you want to kind of sign up for a year's membership or, so there's no, I think you have to say what your professional interest is, but I don't think there'd be any problem about accessing them. But I think what, what's interesting about the, the, the récit de vie at the level of the care home is that um, it just really struck me the, 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 the different 
the, the different kind of forms that they take in that they are published, that there have been publications of books of either multiple stories. So, for example, there is, they, they, many of these care homes run something called Café Souvenir, so kind of memory cafes where there are, there are multiple participants and it might be around a specific theme um, from childhood. And then they gather together all these memories and they publish them in a recueil, in a book. And often the book is then sold and bought by members of the, the families of the, the uh, participants. Otherwise, as I said, some, are, some people don't have any families, uh, but they nonetheless, and, but what was interesting there is that, that, that they are used even for their eulogies, that, that we, they have this bank of information that um, you know, can be used to give a really clearer sense of who that individual was. So there's lots of kind of, I mean, I think what, what the, I mean, there's, there's various kind of obviously problematic aspects, I think, but um, I think what also is problematic is what happens if a person dies before the, the récit de vie is completed. And again, they have, um, you know, the, 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 the recueilleur, recueilleuse, there is a form of kind of contract or they call it a cadre, so a framework to the discussions where the, the elderly person has to say what they want done with this récit de vie if they, if they kind of die during the, the, the process of writing up. So, um, yeah, but so I, I think that there, there, are, there are some people don't want anything, they just want them for themselves. Some people write them themselves and then the recueilleuse or the recueilleur looks through them. So there's, I think what, the, what really comes through is the multiple forms that these um, récits take and the different degrees of um, intervention, narrative intervention on the part of the, the receiver, the writer-upper, so to speak. So, sorry, that was a long answer, but... That was great. We, we have um, three questions now, and we'll take them in turn. So it's Emily, Michelle, and then Julia, please. Well, I just have a question for Kate. Um, I was very interested in your paper. I found it really, really stimulating. I just want to ask a bit about detective novels, because you mentioned that very briefly. And I just, I'm aware, for example, of Elizabeth is Missing and sort of the way the conventions of the genre are used to depict um, dimension. I just wonder if you could say a bit more about such, such texts. Yeah, uh, Elizabeth is Missing is the first uh, anti-detective novel that I read in this genre. And then I started noticing a pattern that's uh, not, not limited to one region or one language either, which I think is really interesting. And uh, I think dementia is key to that because obviously there's issues around uh, memory, but also about the reliability, the reliability of memory, but also the perception that we might have of uh, an older person, an older woman, or an older woman whose memory we might distrust. So <clears throat> I think the genre plays with a lot of stereotypes about who, about trusting a narrative voice and trusting a narrative subject. So it's the, the my my reflection on that has got to the stage of observation, but not to the stage of serious study yet. But but I think that's a really to, really interesting line of uh, thinking about aging femininity and writing about aging femininity. That's proving to be such a, a um, fruitful genre of disrupting the stereotypes of aging femininity and and uh, what we might. Uh, recognize or not recognize in a narrative tip because that's a really good job for disrupting what we might su suspect but yeah Elizabeth is missing is is another key text in that genre and Margarita's just given me another uh, another tip in the chat so so there's there's more texts out there than than I know about but definitely a productive genre yeah. great thank you Well, thank you for this uh, the, the, this panel. Uh, my question is more probably for Kate. Um, I think that when the, the, the grandchild arrives and the grandmother is um, expected to take care of it, or her, or whatever. Um, so my question is, what if she refuses? Have you looked into the, the grandmother who does not want, or doesn't specific, really want to care for that grandchild? And is she then a bad grandmother? Is there the figure of the bad grandmother? Yeah, I, I've not come across that topic yet, but 
Um, I'm sure there must be texts on that topic. My, my focus is uh, not necessarily on mothering or grandmothering. I'm more focused on uh, representations of aging and then looking at the different uh, representation of aging I've come across. But yeah, there's certainly an expectation that um, aging women might uh, participate in the care of grandchildren. But that's, yeah, that's, that's definitely a, an aspect of grandmothering that um, I've not come across yet, but it, it must be there. And it's an important one to, one to look at. Yes. I mean, something that strikes me, that's another aspect of your question is perhaps um, Olga Tokarczuk's text that just doesn't bring up the question. So maybe that's, that's another aspect of writing about mothering or grandmothering, that it's a non-issue in the text. So, so by not addressing it is a way of talking about uh, women and mothering or grandmothering by simply not addressing it. So that, that might be another way of addressing mothering, grandmothering. Mm. Thank you for the question. Yes, I had a question which is really coming from this really interesting parallel across the two panels so that radical narrative forms are, can be representative of life experiences and also that these récits de, de vie following on from Kate's point might be, you know, works of, works of fiction as well as um, useful documents for therapeutic or other, um, other purposes. So my, my question was... Um, my question was, um, really, is there any kind of interaction between a sort of, um, is there any possible interaction between this sense of the récit de vie as a, as a document and as a, a possible um, work which might be looked at within fictional constructs? Sorry, that was for uh, Siobhan. Yeah. In the sense, Julia, that, because I suppose I, I, I you know, I think what, what what the récit de vie. I mean, I suppose I would would kind of the 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 the, the fact that we employ kind of narrative, as you know, very well, Beth and anyone. The fact we employ kind of narrative techniques to write these things up, and they're inevitably self-selecting. I think there is there is um there is a sense that that the narrator, the récit de vie that I'm talking about, in the the care home, which is a more um, authentic version of the life lived, but I think the the, the fact that there is um there is the the involvement and perhaps um, not so much uh, transmission, but in some ways perhaps a transposition of the the narrative voice of the listener onto the the um, the account given by the teller, I think, yeah, inevitably leads to that degree of fictionalization. And I think that's a really interesting, and, and uh, uh, come back to me if this is not what you're, you're getting at, but I think that, that's, that's a very interesting notion that, that even, I mean, Meyerhoff is, is a fascinating figure, as you, you may know, but she, she died from lung cancer age 50 with a whole kind of bank of of work still to be um developed but i think what was what's interesting in her work as you read it maybe within the last of the last 10 years of her life is she she's moving from this notion of i mean it is collaboration but she's beginning to to recognize that even the act even the, the politics of reception of the listener in that that if you are if you're taking notes, you're going to be nodding or interrupting or your physical gestures are going to be guiding the narrative that is given to you by the teller. So she moves from this kind of belief in a kind of just natural objectivity or neutrality um, to a recognition of the kind of inevitable fictionalization of these récits de vie, where the tellers are told to kind of or are encouraged to focus on, you know, the aspects of their past that they want to focus on. So it may be that that they will inevitably choose, you know, the most interesting events of their lives. But I think she moves from the the notion of collaboration. I, and I think in her her most recent essay before she died, she actually she almost talks about a kind of I think she uses the term collusion. So she she's moved from a, a slightly more you know, neutral collaboration between two equal parties to 
this notion of uh, perhaps an acknowledgement of the slightly murkier um, environment in which these received to be materialised. So my my knowledge is only is only based on the kind of um, the, the text that I've dealt with. But I don't know, for example, how the Récit de Vie that are part of the Archives de la Vie Ordinaire came around. I don't know. They're obviously not all from, um, from Schmutzbrand, but many of them end up there. But I don't know the process of gathering, of collating that kind of information um, either. But yeah, I, I, I mean, I, there's not, there's narrativizing one's life. I don't, the, to me, there's not a great deal of difference you know, that, that in some ways that you are, I mean, there is obviously if you're inventing things, but I think there's an inevitable fictionalization to the life as soon as you make it a coherent narrative form. But, but anyway, I don't know if that's what you were getting at. Forgive me if it wasn't. Yeah, it was. Thank you. Really fascinating to think about listening, but also, you know, the, the gathering of stories and the prompts and what are regarded as possibly, you know, big life events or not and how that's might be shaped in terms of you know dominant discourses of older women's lives um that are out there so yeah, that's very interesting kind of around collaboration or collusion yeah, thank you